The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 Edited by Charles F. Horn Cleopatra's Conquest of Caesar and Antony B.C. 51-30 by John P. Mahaffey Several Egyptian princesses of the line of the Ptolemies bore the name of Cleopatra, but history, romance, and tragedy are all illumined with the story of one, Cleopatra, the daughter of Ptolemy Oletes. Born at Alexandria, B.C. 69, she ruled jointly with her brother Ptolemy from 51 to 48. Being then expelled by her colleague, she entered upon the performance of her part in Roman history when her cause was espoused by Julius Caesar, whom she had captivated by her charms. Her reinstatement by the help of Caesar, as well as all that followed in her relations with Roman rulers, was due primarily to personal considerations rather than political or military causes. And among women whose lives have vitally influenced the conduct of great historic leaders and thereby affected the course of events, Cleopatra holds a place at once the most conspicuous and most unique. Like Caesar, Mark Antony, at his first interview with Cleopatra, succumbed to the fascinations of the rare Egyptian, and he never after ceased to be her slave. Not long after Caesar's death, Antony had married Fulvia, whom he deserted for the enchanting queen. From this point to its culmination in overwhelming disaster, and the tragic death of this celebrated pair of lovers, the romantic drama of Cleopatra's conquests becomes even more important in literature than in history. This extraordinary voluptuary, whose beauty and witcheries have interested mankind for almost twenty centuries, has been the subject of some thirty tragedies in various languages, and in Antony and Cleopatra, one of his greatest plays, Shakespeare, closely following the narratives of Plutarch and other classical writers, has invested her with a potency of charm unparalleled among literary creations. She matches Antony in qualities of intellect while she dazzles him with her coquettish arts. A queen, a siren, says Thomas Campbell, a Shakespeare's Cleopatra alone could have entangled Shakespeare's Antony. And Shakespeare alone, as declared by Mrs. Jameson, has dared to exhibit the Egyptian queen with all her greatness and all her littleness, all her paltry arts and dissolute passions, yet awakened our pity for fallen grandeur without once beguiling us into sympathy with guilt. Yet the plain history of this sorceress of the Nile, with her infinite variety, as told by Plutarch and the other ancients, and retold with whatever advantages gained from critical research by the modern masters, makes the same impression of moral contrast and inscrutability as that imparted by the greatest poet who has dramatized the character of Cleopatra. Now at last Egypt, coming into close connection with the world's masters, becomes the stage for some of the most striking scenes in ancient history. They seem to most readers something new and strange. The pageants and passions of the fratricide Cleopatra as something unparalleled. And yet she was one of a race in which almost every reigning princess for the last two hundred years had been swayed by like storms of passion, or had been guilty of like daring violations of common humanity. What Arsinoe, what Cleopatra, from the first to the last, had hesitated to murder a brother or a husband, to assume the throne, to raise and command armies, to discard or adopt a partner of her throne from caprice in policy, or policy in caprice. 
but hitherto this desperate gambling with life had been carried on in Egypt and Syria. The play had been with Hellenistic pawns, Egyptian or Syrian princes. The last Cleopatra came to play with Roman pieces, easier apparently to move than the others, but implying higher stakes, greater glory in the victory, greater disaster in the defeat. Therefore is it that this last Cleopatra, probably no more than an average specimen of the beauty, talent, daring, and cruelty of her ancestors, has taken an unique place among them in the imagination of the world, and holds her own even now and forever as a familiar name throughout the world. Ptolemy Oletes, when dying, had taken great care not to bequeath his mortgaged kingdom to his Roman creditors. In his will he had named as his heirs the elder of his two sons and his daughter, who was the eldest of the family. Nobody thought of claiming Egypt for a heritage of the Roman Republic, when the whole world was the prize proposed in the civil conflict. For though the war of Caesar and Pompey had not actually broken out, the political sky was lowering with blackness, and the coming tempest was muttering its thunder through the sultry air. So Cleopatra, now about sixteen or seventeen years of age, and her much younger brother, about ten, assumed the throne as was traditional, without any tumult, or controversy. The opening discords came from within the royal family. The tutors and advisers of the young king, among whom Parthenos, a eunuch brought up with him as his playmate, according to the custom of the court, was the ablest and most influential, persuaded him to assume sole direction of affairs and to depose his eldest sister. Cleopatra was not able to maintain herself in Alexandria, but went to Syria as an exile, where she promptly collected an army, as was the wont of these Egyptian princesses, who seemed to have resources always under their control, and returned within a few months, says Caesar, by way of Pelusium, to reconquer her lawful share in the throne. This happened in the fourth year of their so-called joint reign, B.C. 48, at the very time that Pompey and Caesar were engaged in their conflict for a far greater kingdom. Caesar expressed his opinion that the quarrel of the sovereigns in Egypt concerned the Roman people and himself as consul, the more so as it was in his previous consulate that the recognition of and alliance with their father had taken place. So he signified his decision that Ptolemy and Cleopatra should dismiss their armies and should discuss their claims before him by argument and not by arms. All our authorities, except Dio Cassius, state that he sent for Cleopatra that she might personally urge her claims, but Dio tells us, with far more detail and, I think, greater probability, that at first the quarrel with her brother was argued for her by friends, till she, learning the amorous character of Caesar, sent him word that her case was being mismanaged by her advocates, and she desired to plead it herself. She was then in the flower of her age, about twenty, and celebrated for her beauty. Moreover, she had the sweetest of voices and every charm of conversation, so that she was likely to ensnare even the most obdurate and elderly man. These gifts she regarded as her claims upon Caesar. She prayed therefore for an interview, and adorned herself in a garb most becoming, but likely to arouse his pity, and so came secretly by night to visit him. If she indeed arrived secretly, and was carried into the palace by one faithful follower as a bale of carpet, 
It was from fear of assassination by the party of Pothinus. She knew that as soon as she had reached Caesar's sentries, she was safe. As the event proved, she was more than safe, for in the brief interval of peace, and perhaps even of apparent jollity, while the royal dispute was under discussion, she gained an influence over Caesar, which she retained till his death. Caesar adjudicated the throne according to the will of Olates. He even restored Cyprus to Egypt, and proposed to send the younger brother and his sister Arsinoe to govern it. But he also insisted on a repayment, in part at least, of the enormous outstanding debt of Oletes to him and his party. A few months after Caesar's departure from Egypt, Cleopatra gave birth to a son whom she alleged, without any immediate contradiction, to be the dictator's. The Alexandrians called him Caesarian, and she never swerved from asserting for him royal privileges. We hear of no other lover, though it is impossible to imagine Cleopatra arriving at the age of twenty without providing herself with this luxury. She was, however, afraid to let Caesar live far from her influence, and some time before his assassination, that is to say, some time between B.C. 48 and 44, she came with the young king, her brother, to Rome, where she was received in Caesar's palace beyond the Tiber, causing by her residence there considerable scandal among the stricter Romans. Cicero confesses that he went to see her, but protests that his reasons for doing so were absolutely non-political. Cicero found her haughty. He does not say she was beautiful and fascinating. We do not hear of any political activity on her part, though Cicero evidently suspects it. It is well nigh impossible that she can have preferred her very doubtful position at Rome to her brilliant life in the East. She was suspected of urging Caesar to move eastward the capital of his new empire, to desert Rome, and choose either Ilium, the imaginary cradle of his race, or Alexandria as his residence. She is likely to have encouraged at all events his expedition against the Parthians, which would bring him to Syria, whence she hoped to gain new territory for her son. The whole situation is eloquently, perhaps too eloquently, described by Merivale, for he weaves in many conjectures of his own, as if they were ascertained facts. The colors of this imitation of a hateful original, the Oriental despot, were heightened by the demeanor of Cleopatra, who followed her lover to Rome at his invitation. She came with the younger Ptolemaeus, who now shared her throne, and her ostensible object was to negotiate a treaty between her kingdom and the commonwealth. While the Egyptian nation was formally admitted to the friendship and alliance of Rome, its sovereign was lodged in Caesar's villa on the other side of the Tiber, and the statue of the most fascinating of women was erected in the temple of the goddess of love and beauty. The connection which subsisted between her and the dictator was unblushingly avowed. Public opinion demanded no concessions to its delicacy. The feelings of the injured Calpurnia had been blunted by repeated outrage, and Cleopatra was encouraged to proclaim openly that her child Caesarion was the son of her Roman admirer. A tribune named Helvius Cinna ventured, it is said, to assert among his friends that he was prepared to propose a law, with the dictator's sanction, to enable him to marry more wives than one for the sake of progeny, and to disregard in his choice the legitimate qualification of Roman descent. The Romans, however, were spared this last insult to their prejudices. 
the queen of egypt felt bitterly the scorn with which she was popularly regarded as the representative of an effeminate and licentious people it is not improbable that she employed her fatal influence to withdraw her lover from the roman capital and urged him to schemes of oriental conquest to bring him more completely within her toils in the meanwhile the haughtiness of her demeanour corresponded with the splendid anticipations in which she indulged she held a court in the suburbs of the city at which the adherents of the dictator's policy were not the only attendants even his opponents and concealed enemies were glad to bask in the sunshine of her smiles when caesar was assassinated she was still at rome and had some wild hopes of having her son recognized by the caesareans but failing in this she escaped secretly and sailed to egypt not without causing satisfaction to cautious men like cicero that she was gone the passage in which he seems to allude to a rumor that she was about to have another child another misfortune to the state does not bear that interpretation as he says not a word concerning the young king ptolemy we may assume that the youth was already dead and that he died at rome the common belief was that cleopatra poisoned him as soon as his increasing years made him troublesome to her in her reign four years are assigned to a joint rule with her elder brother four more to that with her younger so that this latter must have died in the same year as caesar cleopatra watching from egypt the great civil war which ensued summoned and commanded by the various leaders to send aid in ships and money threatened with plunder and confiscation by those who were now exhausting asia minor and the islands with monstrous exactions had ample occupation for her talents in steering safely among these constant dangers appian says she pleaded famine and pestilence in her country in declining the demands of cassius for subsidies the latter was on the point of invading egypt at the moment denuded of defending forces and wasted with famine when he was summoned to philippi by brutus it was not till b c forty one after the decisive battle of philippi that the victorious antony turning to subdue the east to the caesarian cause held his joyous entree into ephesus and then proceeded to drain all asia minor of money for the satisfaction of his greedy legionaries and his own still more greedy vices reaching cilicia he sent an order to the queen of egypt to come before him and explain her conduct during the late war for she was reported to have sent aid to cassius the sequel may be told in plutarch's famous narrative delius who was sent on this message had no sooner seen her face and remarked her adroitness and subtlety in speech than he felt convinced that antony would not so much as think of giving any molestation to a woman like this on the contrary she would be the first in favour with him so he set himself at once to pay his court to the egyptian and gave her his advice to go in the homeric style to cilicia in her best attire and bade her fear nothing from antony the gentlest and kindest of soldiers she had some faith in the words of delius but more in her own attractions which having formally recommended her to caesar and the young cineas pompey she did not doubt might yet prove more successful with antony their acquaintance was with her when a girl young and ignorant of the world but she was to meet antony in the time of life when women's beauty is most splendid and their intellects are in full maturity she made great preparation for her journey of money 
gifts, and ornaments of value, such as so wealthy a kingdom might afford. But she brought with her her surest hopes in her own magic arts and charms. She received several letters, both from Antony and from his friends, to summon her, but she took no account of these orders, and at last, as if in mockery of them, she came sailing up the river Sidnus, in a barge with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and fifes and harps. She herself lay all along under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in her picture, and beautiful young boys, like painted cupids, stood on each side to fan her. Her maids were dressed like sea nymphs and graces, some steering at the rudder, some working at the ropes. The perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel to the shore, which was covered with multitudes, part following the galley up the river on either bank, part running out of the city to see the sight. The marketplace was quite emptied, and Antony at last was left alone sitting upon the tribunal, while the word went through all the multitude that Venus was come to feast with Bacchus for the common good of Asia. On her arrival, Antony sent to invite her to supper. She thought it fitter he should come to her, so, willing to show his good humor and courtesy, he complied and went. He found the preparations to receive him magnificent beyond expression, but nothing so admirable as the great number of lights, for on a sudden there was let down altogether so great a number of branches with lights in them, so ingeniously disposed, some in squares and some in circles, that the whole thing was a spectacle that has seldom been equaled for beauty. The next day Antony invited her to supper, and was very desirous to outdo her as well in magnificence as contrivance, but he found he was altogether beaten in both, and was so well convinced of it, that he was himself the first to jest and mock at his poverty of wit and his rustic awkwardness. She, perceiving that his raillery was broad and gross, and savoured more of the soldier than the courtier, rejoined in the same taste, and fell into it at once, without any sort of reluctance or reserve, for her actual beauty, it is said, was not in itself so remarkable that none could be compared with her or that no one could see her without being struck by it, but the contact of her presence, if you lived with her, was irresistible. The attraction of her person, joining with the charm of her conversation, and the character that attended all she said or did, was something bewitching. It was a pleasure merely to hear the sound of her voice, with which, like an instrument of many strings, she could pass from one language to another, so that there were few of the barbarian nations that she answered by an interpreter. To most of them she spoke herself, as to the Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Hebrews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes, Parthians, and many others, whose language she had learned, which was all the more surprising, because most of the kings, her predecessors, scarcely gave themselves the trouble to acquire the Egyptian tongue, and several of them quite abandoned the Macedonian. Antony was so captivated by her, that while Fulvia his wife maintained his quarrels in Rome against Caesar by actual force of arms, and the Parthian troops, commanded by Labinus, the king's generals having made him commander-in-chief, were assembled in Mesopotamia, and ready to enter Syria, he could yet suffer himself to be carried away by her to Alexandria, there to keep holiday, like a boy, in play and diversion, squandering and fooling away in enjoyments that most costly, as Antiphon says, of all valuables, time. <laughs>
They had a sort of company, to which they gave a particular name, calling it that of the Inimitable Livers. The members entertained one another daily in turn, with an extravagance of expenditure beyond measure or belief. Philotas, a physician of Amphissa, who was at that time a student of medicine in Alexandria, used to tell my grandfather Lamprius that, having some acquaintance with one of the royal cooks, he was invited by him, being a young man, to come and see the sumptuous preparations for dinner. So he was taken into the kitchen, where he admired the prodigious variety of all things, but particularly seeing eight wild boars roasting whole, says he, Surely you have a great number of guests. The cook laughed at his simplicity, and told him there were not above twelve to dine, but that every dish was to be served up just roasted to a turn, and if anything was but one minute ill-timed, it was spoiled. And, said he, maybe Antony will dine just now, maybe not this hour, maybe he will call for wine, or begin to talk, and will put it off. So that, he continued, it is not one, but many dinners must be had in readiness, as it is impossible to guess at his hour. Plato admits four sorts of flattery, but Cleopatra had a thousand. Were Antony serious or disposed to mirth, she had any moment some new delight or charm to meet his wishes. At every turn she was upon him, and let him escape her neither by day nor by night. She played at dice with him, drank with him, hunted with him, and when he exercised in arms she was there to see. At night she would go rambling with him to joke with people at their doors and windows, dressed like a servant woman, for Antony also went in servant's disguise, and from these expeditions he always came home very scurvily answered, and sometimes even beaten severely, though most people guessed who it was. However, the Alexandrians in general liked it all well enough, and joined good-humouredly and kindly in his frolic and play, saying they were much obliged to Antony for acting his tragic parts at Rome, and keeping his comedy for them. It would be trifling without end to be particular in relating his follies, but his fishing must not be forgotten. He went out one day to angle with Cleopatra, and being so unfortunate as to catch nothing in the presence of his mistress, he gave secret orders to the fishermen to dive under water and put fishes that had been already taken upon his hooks, and there he drew in so fast that the Egyptian perceived it. But, feigning great admiration, she told everybody how dexterous Antony was, and invited them next day to come and see him again. So when a number of them had come on board the fishing boats, as soon as he had let down his hook, one of her servants was beforehand with his divers, and fixed upon his hook a salted fish from Pontus. Antony, feeling his line taut, drew up the prey, and when, as may be imagined, great laughter ensued, Leave, said Cleopatra the fishing-rod, autocrat, to us poor sovereigns of Pharos and Canopus. Your game is cities, kingdoms, and continents. Plutarch does not mention the most tragic and the most characteristic proof of Cleopatra's complete conquest of Antony. Among his other crimes of obedience, he sent by her orders and put to death the princess Arsinoe, who, knowing well her danger, had taken refuge as a suppliant in the temple of Artemis Leucophryne at Miletus. End of section 30。section 31 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Cleopatra's Conquest of Caesar and Antony. B.C. 51 to 30. By John P. Mahaffey. It is not our duty to follow the various complications of war and diplomacy, accompanied by the marriage with the serious and gentle Octavia, whereby the brilliant but dissolute Antony was weaned, as it were, from his follies, and persuaded to live a life of public activity. Whether the wily Octavian did not foresee the result, whether he did not even sacrifice his sister to accumulate odium against his dangerous rival, is not for us to determine. But when it was arranged, in B.C. 36, that Antony should lead an expedition against the Parthians, any man of ordinary sense must have known that he would come within the reach of the eastern siren, and was sure to be again attracted by her fatal voice. It is hard to account for her strange patience during these four years. She had borne twins to Antony, probably after the meeting in Cilicia, though she still maintained the claims of her eldest son, Caesarion, to be the divine Julius's only direct heir, we do not hear of her sending requests to Antony to support him, or that any agents were working in her interests at Rome. She was too subtle a woman to solicit his return to Alexandria. There are mistaken insinuations that she thought the chances of Sextus Pompey, with his naval supremacy, better than those of Antony. But these stories refer to her brother, Cineus, who visited Egypt before Pharsalia. It is probably to this pause in her life as we know it that we may refer her activity in repairing and enlarging the national temples. The splendid edifice at Dendera, at present among the most perfect of Egyptian temples, bears no older names than those of Cleopatra and her son Caesarion, and their portraits represent the latter as a growing lad, his mother as an essentially Egyptian figure, conventionally drawn according to the rules which had determined the figures of gods and kings for fifteen hundred years. Under these circumstances, it is idle to speak of this well-known relief picture as a portrait of the queen. It is no more so than the granite statues in the Vatican are portraits of Philadelphus and Arsinoe. The artist had probably never seen the queen, and if he had, it would not have produced the slightest alteration in his drawing. Plutarch expressly says, that it was not in peerless beauty that her fascination lay, but in the combination of more than average beauty with many other personal attractions. The Egyptian portrait is likely to confirm in the spectator's mind the impression derived from Shakespeare's play that Cleopatra was a swarthy Egyptian in strong contrast to the fair Roman ladies and suggesting a wide difference of race. She was no more an Egyptian than she was an Indian, but a pure Macedonian, of a race akin to, and perhaps fairer than, the Greeks. No sooner had Antony reached Syria than the fell influence of the Egyptian queen revived. In the words of Plutarch, But the mischief that thus long had lain still, the passion for Cleopatra, which better thoughts had seemed to have lulled and charmed into oblivion, upon his approach to Syria, gathered strength again, and broke out into a flame. And, in fine, like Plato's restive and rebellious horse of the human soul, flinging off all good and wholesome counsel, and breaking fairly loose, he sent Fonteus Capito, 
to bring Cleopatra into Syria, to whom at her arrival he made no small or trifling present. Phoenicia, Col Syria, Cyprus, great part of Cilicia, that side of Judea which produces balm, that part of Arabia, where the Nabathaeans extend to the outer sea, profuse gifts which much displeased the Romans. For although he had invested several private persons with great governments and kingdoms, and bereaved many kings of theirs, as Antigonus of Judea, whose head he caused to be struck off, the first example of that punishment being inflicted on a king, yet nothing stung the Romans like the shame of these honors paid to Cleopatra. Their dissatisfaction was augmented also by his acknowledging as his own the twin children he had by her, giving them the names of Alexander and Cleopatra, and adding as their surnames the titles of Sun and Moon. After much dallying, the triumvir really started for the wild east, whether it is not our business to follow him. Cleopatra he sent home to Egypt to await his victorious return, and it was on this occasion that she came in state to Jerusalem to visit Herod the Great, probably the most brilliant scene of the kind which had taken place since the Queen of Sheba came to learn the wisdom of Solomon. But it was a very different wisdom that Herod professed, and in which he was verily a high authority. Nor was the subtle daughter of the Ptolemies a docile pupil, but a practiced expert in the same arts of cruelty and cunning, wherewith both pursued their several courses of ambition and sought to wheedle from their Roman masters cities and provinces. The reunion of Antony and Cleopatra must have greatly alarmed Herod, whose plans were directly thwarted by the freaks of Antony, and he must have been preparing at the time to make his case with Octavian, and seek from his favor protection against the new caprices of the then lord of the East. The scene at Herod's palace must have been inimitable. The display of counter-fascinations between these two tigers, their voluptuous natures mutually attracted, their hatred giving to each that deep interest in the other, which so often turns to mutual passion while it incites to conquest. The grace and finish of their manners, concealing a ruthless ferocity, the splendor of their appointments. What more dramatic picture can we imagine in history? We hear that she actually attempted to seduce Herod, but failed, owing to his deep devotion to his wife Mariamne. The prosaic Josephus adds that Herod consulted his counsel whether he should not put her to death for this attempt upon his virtue. He was dissuaded by them on the ground that Antony would listen to no arguments, not even from the most persuasive of the world's princes, and would take awful vengeance when he heard of her death. So she was escorted with great gifts and politenesses back to Egypt. Such, then, was the character of this notorious queen. But her violation of temples and even of ancient tombs for the sake of treasure, must have been a far more public and odious exhibition of that want of respect for the sentiment of others which is the essence of bad manners. As is well known, the first campaign of Antony against Armenians and Parthians was a signal failure, and it was only with great difficulty that he escaped the fate of Crassus, but Cleopatra was ready to meet him in Syria with provisions and clothes for his distressed and ragged battalions, and he returned with her to spend the winter, B.C. 36-35, to 35, at Alexandria. She thus snatched him again from his noble wife Octavia, who had come from Rome to Athens with succors even greater than Cleopatra had brought.
This, at least, is the word of the historians who write in the interests of the Romans, and regard the Queen of Egypt with horror and with fear. The new campaign of Antony, B.C. 34, was apparently more prosperous, but it was only carried far enough to warrant his holding a Roman triumph at Alexandria. Perhaps the only novelty in pomp which the triumvir could exhibit to the Alexandrian populace while it gave the most poignant offence at Rome. It was apparently now that he made that formal distribution of provinces which Octavian used as his chief casus belli. Nor was the division he made among his sons at Alexandria less unpopular. It seemed a theatrical piece of insolence and contempt of his country for assembling the people in the exercise ground and causing two golden thrones to be placed on a platform of silver, the one for him and the other for Cleopatra, and at their feet lower thrones for their children, he proclaimed Cleopatra queen of Egypt, Cyprus, Libya, and Coliseria, and with her conjointly Caesarian, the reputed son of the former Caesar. His own sons by Cleopatra were to have the style of king of kings. To Alexander he gave Armenia and Medea, with Parthia so soon as it should be overcome, to Ptolemy, Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia. Alexander was brought out before the people in Median costume, the tiara and upright peak, and Ptolemy in boots and mantle, and Macedonian cap done about with the diadem. For this was the habit of the successors of Alexander, as the other was of the Medes and Armenians. And as soon as they had saluted their parents, the one was received by a guard of Macedonians, the other by one of Armenians. Cleopatra was then as at other times when she appeared in public, dressed in the habit of the goddess Isis, and gave audience to the people under the name of the new Isis. This over, he gave Prien to his players for a habitation, and set sail for Athens, where fresh sports and play-acting employed him. Cleopatra, jealous of the honors Octavia had received at Athens, for Octavia was much beloved by the Athenians, courted the favor of the people with all sorts of attentions. The Athenians, in requital, having decreed her public honors, deputed several of the citizens to wait upon her at her house, among whom went Antony as one, he being an Athenian citizen, and he it was that made the speech. The speed and extent of Antony's preparations alarmed Caesar, who feared he might be forced to fight the decisive battle that summer, for he wanted many necessaries, and the people grudged very much to pay the taxes, freemen being called upon to pay a fourth part of their incomes, and freed slaves an eighth of their property, so that there were loud outcries against him and disturbances throughout all Italy. And this is looked upon as one of the greatest of Antony's oversights that he did not then press the war, for he allowed time at once for Caesar to make his preparations, and for the commotions to pass over, for while people were having their money called for, they were mutinous and violent, but having paid it, they held their peace. Titius and Plancus, men of consular dignity and friends to Antony, having been ill-used by Cleopatra, whom they had most resisted in her design of being present in the war, came over to Caesar, and gave information of the contents of Antony's will, with which they were acquainted. It was deposited in the hands of the Vestal Virgins, who refused to deliver it up, and sent Caesar word, if he pleased, he should come and seize it himself, which he did. And, reading it over to himself, 
he noted those places that were most for his purpose, and, having summoned the Senate, read them publicly. Many were scandalized at the proceeding, thinking it out of reason and equity to call a man to account for what was not to be until after his death. Caesar specially pressed what Antony said in his will about his burial, for he had ordered that even if he died in the city of Rome, his body, after being carried in state through the forum, should be sent to Cleopatra at Alexandria. Calvisius, a dependent of Caesar's, urged other charges in connection with Cleopatra against Antony, that he had given her the library of Pergamus, containing two hundred thousand distinct volumes, that at a great banquet in the presence of many guests he had risen up and rubbed her feet to fulfill some wager or promise that he had suffered the ephesians to salute her as their queen that he had frequently at the public audience of kings and princes received amorous messages written in tablets made of onyx and crystal and read them openly on the tribunal that when Fernius, a man of great authority and eloquence among the Romans, was pleading, Cleopatra happening to pass by in her litter, Antony started up and left them in the middle of their cause to follow at her side and attend her home. When war was declared, Antony sought to gain the support of the East in the conflict, he made alliance with a Median king who betrothed his daughter to Cleopatra's infant son Alexander, but he made the fatal mistake of allowing Cleopatra to accompany him to Samos, where he gathered his army, and even to Actium, where she led the way in flying from the fight and so persuading the infatuated Antony to leave his army and join in her disgraceful escape. Historians have regarded this act of Cleopatra as the mere cowardice of a woman who feared to look upon an armed conflict and join in the din of battle, but she was surely made of sterner stuff. She had probably computed with the utmost care the chances of the rivals, and had made up her mind that, in spite of Antony's gallantry, his cause was lost. If she fought out the battle with her strong contingent of ships, she would probably fall into Octavian's hands as a prisoner, and would have no choice between suicide or death in the Roman prison, after being exhibited to the mob in Octavian's triumph. There was no chance whatever that she would have been spared, as was her sister Arsinoe after Julius Caesar's triumph, nor would such clemency be less hateful than death. But there was still a chance, if Antony were killed or taken prisoner, that she might negotiate with the victor as queen of Egypt, with her fleet, army, and treasures intact. And who could tell what effect her charms, though now full ripe, might have upon the conqueror? Two great Romans had yielded to her, why not the third, who seemed a smaller man? This view implies that she was already false to Antony, and it may well be asked how such a charge is compatible with the affecting scenes which followed at Alexandria, where her policy seemed defeated by her passion, and she felt her old love too strong even for her heartless ambition. I will say in answer that there is no more frequent anomaly in the psychology of female love than a strong passion coexisting with selfish ambition, so that each takes the lead in turn. Nay, even the consciousness of treachery may so intensify the passion as to make a woman embrace with keener transports the lover whom she has betrayed than one whom she has no thought of surrendering.
There are, moreover, in these tragedies unexpected accidents, which so affect even the hardest nature, that calculations are cast aside, and the old loyalty resumes a temporary sway. Nor must we fail to insist again upon the traditions wherein this last Cleopatra was born and bred. She came from a stock whose women played with love and with life as if they were mere counters. To hesitate whether such a scion of such a house would have delayed to discard Antony and to assume another passion is to show small appreciation of the effects of heredity and of example. Dion tells us that she arrived in Alexandria before the news of her defeat, pretended a victory, and took the occasion of committing many murders, in order to get rid of secret opponents, and also to gather wealth by confiscation of their goods, for both she and Antony, who came along the coast of Libya, seem still to have thought of defending the inaccessible Egypt, and making terms for themselves and their children with the conqueror. But Antony's efforts completely failed. No one would rally to his standard. And, meanwhile, the false queen had begun to send presents to Caesar and encourage him to treat with her. But when he bluntly proposed to her to murder Antony as the price of her reconciliation with himself, and when he even declared by proxy that he was in love with her, he clearly made a rash move in this game of diplomacy, though Dion says he persuaded her of his love, and that, accordingly, she betrayed to him the fortress of Pelusium, the key of the country. Dion also differs from Plutarch in repeatedly ascribing to Octavian great anxiety to secure the treasures which Cleopatra had with her, and which she was likely to destroy by fire if driven to despair. The historian may well leave to the biographer, nay, to the poet, the affecting details of the closing scenes of Cleopatra's life. In the fourth and fifth acts of Antony and Cleopatra, Shakespeare has reproduced every detail of Plutarch's narrative, which was drawn from that of her physician Olympos. Her fascinations were not dead, for they swayed Dolabella to play false to his master so far as to warn her of his intentions, and leave her time for her dignified and royal end. But if these Hellenistic queens knew how to die, they knew not how to live. Even the penultimate scene of the tragedy, when she presents an inventory of her treasures to Octavian, and is charged by her steward with dishonesty, shows her in uncivilized violence, striking the man in the face and bursting into indecent fury, such as an Athenian, still less a Roman matron, would have been ashamed to exhibit. Nor is there any reason to doubt the genuineness of this scene, though we must not be weary of cautioning ourselves against the hostile witnesses who have reported to us her life. They praise nothing in her but her bewitching presence and her majestic death. After her repast, Cleopatra sent to Caesar a letter which she had written and sealed, and putting everybody out of the monument but her two women, she shut the doors. Caesar, opening her letter, and finding pathetic prayers and entreaties that she might be buried in the same tomb with Antony, soon guessed what was doing. At first he was going himself in all haste, but, changing his mind, he sent others to see. The thing had been quickly done. The messengers came at full speed, and found the guards apprehensive of nothing. But on opening the doors they saw her stone dead, lying upon a bed of gold, set out in all her royal ornaments. Eras, one of her women, lay dying at her feet, and Charmian, just ready to fall, scarce able to hold up her head, was adjusting her mistress's diadem 
and when one that came in said angrily, Was this well done of your lady, Charmian? Perfectly well, she answered, and as became the daughter of so many kings. And as she said this, she fell down dead by the bedside. Even the hostile accounts cannot conceal from us that both in physique and in intellect she was a very remarkable figure, exceptional in her own, exceptional had she been born in any other age. She is a speaking instance of the falsehood of a prevailing belief that the intermarriage of near relations invariably produces a decadence in the human race. The whole dynasty of the Ptolemies contradicts this current theory, and exhibits in the last of the series the most signal exception. Cleopatra the Sixth was descended from many generations of breeding in, of which four exhibit marriages of full brother and sister, and yet she was deficient in no quality, physical or intellectual, which goes to make up a well-bred and well-developed human being. Her morals were indeed those of her ancestors, and as bad as could be, but I am not aware that it is degeneration in this direction which is assumed by the theory in question, except as a consequence of physical decay. Physically, however, Cleopatra was perfect. She was not only beautiful, but prolific, and retained her vigor, and apparently her beauty, to the time of her death, when she was nearly forty years old. End of section 31《Section 32 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, and John Rudd. Assassination of Caesar, B.C. 44, by Bartold Georg Niebuhr. Caesar's assassination forms the groundwork of one of Shakespeare's most notable tragedies, the itching palm of Cassius, Brutus's rectitude and honesty of purpose, and Mark Antony's oration, will ever live while the English language endures. When the great Caesar was struck down, the civil war was over, and he was master of the world. The month of the year B.C. 100, in which he was born, Quinctilis, was afterward called in his honor July. Caius Julius Caesar was one of the greatest figures in history, and early took a prominent part in the affairs of Rome. He was a rival of Cicero, in forensic eloquence, and highly esteemed as a writer, his commentaries being universally admired. Ransomed from pirates who had captured him on his way to study philosophy at Rhodes, he attacked them in turn, took them to Pergamus, and crucified them. After various successful engagements, Caesar marched against Pharnaces, now established in the kingdom of the Bosphorus, gaining at Zela, in Pontus, the decisive victory, which he announced in the famous dispatch, Veni Vidi Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. His unbounded affability, his liveliness and cordiality, his unaffected kindness to his friends, had made him popular with the high as well as the low. His ambition began to show itself. During the wrangles over the election of Afrinius as consul, Caesar returned from his brilliant successes in Spain. The troops saluted him as imperator, and the Senate voted a thanksgiving in his honor. He was now strong enough to take his place as the leader of the popular party. He was elected consul, in spite of the hostility of the Senate. A coalition was formed 
between Caesar and Pompey. Caesar's agrarian law added to his popularity with the people, and he gained the influence of the equities by relief of one-third of the farmed taxes of Asia. He now became proconsul of Illyricum and Gaul for five years. This suited his ambition. At this time, Pompey was the absolute master of Rome, and now arose his duel for power with Caesar. For a time, he opposed the latter's election as consul, but later yielded. Caesar had achieved his brilliant success beyond the Alps. He had won victories in Gaul and Britain. But in the meantime, his enemies had been active at Rome. Still believing that the Senate would permit his quiet election to the consulship, he refused to strike any blow at their authority. But the Senate had determined to humble Caesar. Both Pompey and Caesar were removed from leadership, but the consul Marcellus refused to execute the decree. Caesar was directed by the Senate to disband his army by a fixed day, on pain of being considered a public enemy. Pompey sided with the Senate. This meant civil war. Antony and Cassius fled to the camp of Caesar, who was enthusiastically supported by his soldiers, and crossed the Rubicon. Having become master of all Italy in three months without a battle, Caesar re-entered Rome. Pompey had fled, and at the Battle of Pharsalia was utterly rooted, and took refuge in Egypt, where he was murdered a few days before the arrival of Caesar. Upon receipt of the news of Pompey's death, Caesar was named dictator for one year. The government was now placed without disguise in his hands. He was invested with the tribunician power for life. He was also again elected consul and named dictator. Caesar had now become a demigod and was named dictator for ten years, being awarded a fourfold triumph and a thanksgiving being decreed for forty days. He was also made censor. This was in B.C. 46. After defeating the remnant of the Pompeians, he returned to Rome in September B.C. 45 and was named Imperator, and appointed consul for ten years and dictator for life, being hailed as Parens Patriae. All these triumphs had caused jealousies. It was thought that he aspired to become king, and this led to his fall. Niebuhr. It is one of the inestimable advantages of a hereditary government, commonly called the legitimate, whatever its forms may be, that it may be formally inactive in regard to the state and the population that it may reserve its interference until it is absolutely necessary, and apparently leave things to take their own course. If we look around us and observe the various constitutions, we shall scarcely perceive the interference of the government. The greater part of the time passes away, without those who have the reins in their hands being obliged to pay any particular attention to what they are doing, and a very large amount of individual liberty may be enjoyed. But if the government is what we call a usurpation, the ruler is not only to take care to maintain his power, but in all that he undertakes he has to consider by what means and in what ways he can establish his right to govern and his own personal qualifications for it. Men who are in such a position are urged on to act by a very sad necessity from which they cannot escape, and such was the position of Caesar at Rome. In our European states, men have wide and extensive spheres in which they can act and move. The much decried system of centralization has indeed many disadvantages, but it has this advantage for the ruler, that he can exert an activity which shows its influence far and wide. But what could Caesar do in the center of nearly the whole of the known world? He could not hope to effect any material improvements either in Italy or in the provinces. He had been accustomed, from his youth, 
and more especially during the last fifteen years, to an enormous activity, and idleness was intolerable to him. At the close of the Civil War he would have had little or nothing to do unless he had turned his attention to some foreign enterprise. He was obliged to venture upon something that would occupy his whole soul, for he could not rest. His thoughts were therefore again directed to war, and that in a quarter where the most brilliant triumphs awaited him, where the bones of the legions of Crassus lay unavenged, to a war against the Parthians. About this time, the Giti also had spread in Thrace, and he intended to check their progress likewise. But his main problem was to destroy the Parthian Empire and to extend the Roman dominion as far as India, a plan in which he would certainly have been successful. And he himself felt so sure of this that he was already thinking of what he should undertake afterward. It is by no means incredible that, as we are told, he intended on his return to march through the passes of the Caucasus and through ancient Scythia into the country of the Geti, and thence through Germany and Gaul into Italy. Besides this expedition, he entertained other plans of no less gigantic dimensions. The port of Ashtia was bad, and in reality little better than a mere roadstead, so that great ships could not come up from the river. Accordingly, it is said that Caesar intended to dig a canal for sea ships, from the Tiber, above or below Rome, through the Pomptine marshes, as far as Terracina. He further contemplated to cut through the isthmus of Corinth. It is not easy to see in what manner he would have accomplished this, considering the state of hydraulic architecture in those times. The Roman canals were mere fossae, and canals with sluices, though not unknown to the Romans, were not constructed by them. Footnote. The first canals with sluices were executed by the Dutch in the 15th century. End footnote. The fact of Caesar forming such enormous plans is not very surprising, but we can scarcely comprehend how it was possible for him to accomplish so much of what he undertook in the short time of five months preceding his death. Following the unfortunate system of Sulla, Caesar founded throughout Italy a number of colonies of veterans. The old Sulanian colonists were treated with great severity, and many of them and their children were expelled from their lands, and were thus punished for the cruelty which they or their fathers had committed against the inhabitants of the municipia. In like manner, colonies were established in southern Gaul, Italy, Africa, and other parts. I may mention in particular the colonies founded at Carthage and Corinth. The latter, however, was a colonia libertinorum, and never rose to any importance. We do not know the details of its foundation, but one would imagine that Caesar would have preferred restoring the place as a purely Greek town. This, however, he did not do. Its population was and remained a mixed one, and Corinth never rose to a state of real prosperity. Caesar made various new arrangements in the state, and among others he restored the full franchise, or the just honorum, to the sons of those who had been prescribed in the time of Sulla. He had obtained for himself the title of emperor and the dictatorship for life and the consulship for ten years. Half of the offices of the Republic, to which persons had before been elected by the centuries, were in his gift, and for the other half, he usually recommended candidates, so that the elections were merely nominal. The tribes seem to have retained their rights of election uncurtailed, and the last tribunes must have been elected by the people. But although Caesar did not himself confer the consulship, yet the whole republic was reduced to a mere form and appearance. Caesar made various new laws and regulations, for example, to lighten the burdens of debtors and the like. But the changes he introduced in the form of the Constitution 
were of little importance. He increased the number of praetors, which Sulla had raised to eight, successively to ten, twelve, fourteen, and sixteen, and the number of quaestors was increased to forty. Hence the number of persons from whom the Senate was to be filled up became greater than that of the vacancies, and Caesar accordingly increased the number of senators, though it is uncertain what number he fixed upon, and raised a great many of his friends to the dignity of senators. In this, as in many other cases, he acted very arbitrarily, for he elected into the Senate whomsoever he pleased, and conferred the franchise in a manner equally arbitrary. These things did not fail to create much discontent. It is a remarkable fact that notwithstanding his mode of filling up the Senate, not even the majority of senators were attached to his cause after his death. If we consider the changes and regulations which Caesar introduced, it must strike us as a singular circumstance that among all his measures there is no trace of any indicating that he thought of modifying the Constitution for the purpose of putting an end to the anarchy, for all his changes are in reality not essential or of great importance. Sulla felt the necessity of remodeling the Constitution, but he did not attain his end, and the manner too in which he set about it was that of a short-sighted man, but he was at least intelligent enough to see that the Constitution as it then was could not continue to exist. In the regulations of Caesar we see no trace of such a conviction, and I think that he despaired of the possibility of effecting any real good by constitutional reforms. Hence, among all his laws, there is not one that had any relation to the Constitution. The fact of his increasing the number of patrician families had no reference to the Constitution. So far, in fact, were the patricians from having any advantages over the plebeians that the office of the two Aedilus Cerealis, which Caesar instituted, was confined to the plebeians, a regulation which was opposed to the very nature of the patriciate. His raising persons to the rank of patricians was neither more nor less than the modern practice of raising a family to the rank of nobility. He picked out an individual and gave him the rank of patrician for himself and his descendants, but did not elevate a whole gens. The distinction itself was merely a nominal one, and conferred no privilege upon a person except that of holding certain priestly offices, which could be filled by none but patricians and for which their number was scarcely sufficient. If Caesar had died quietly, the Republic would have been in the same, nay, in a much worse state of dissolution than if he had not existed at all. I consider it a proof of the wisdom and good sense of Caesar that he did not, like Sulla, think an improvement in the state of public affairs so near at hand or a matter of so little difficulty. The cure of the disease lay yet at a very great distance, and the first condition on which it could be undertaken was the sovereignty of Caesar, a condition which would have been quite unbearable even to many of his followers, who, as rebels, did not scruple to go along with him. But Rome could no longer exist as a republic. It is curious to see in Cicero's work, De Republica, the consciousness running through it, that Rome, as it then stood, required the strong hand of a king. Cicero had surely often owned this to himself, but he saw no one who would have entered into such an idea. The title of king had a great fascination for Caesar, as it had for Cromwell, a surprising phenomenon in a practical mind like that of Caesar. Everyone knows the fact that while Caesar was sitting on the suggestum, during the celebration of the Lupercalia, Antony presented to him the diadem, to try how the people would take it. Caesar saw the great alarm which the act created, and declined the diadem for the sake of appearance. But had the people been silent, Caesar would unquestionably have accepted it.
His refusal was accompanied by loud shouts of acclamation, which for the present rendered all further attempts impossible. Antony then had a statue of Caesar adorned with the diadem. But two tribunes of the people, Alcasitius Flavus and Epidius Marullus, took it away. And here Caesar showed the real state of his feelings, for he treated the conduct of the tribunes as a personal insult toward himself. He had lost his self-possession, and his fate carried him irresistibly onward. He wished to have the tribunes imprisoned, but was prevailed upon to be satisfied with their being stripped of their office, and sent into exile. This created a great sensation at Rome. Caesar had also been guilty of an act of thoughtlessness, or perhaps merely of distraction, as might happen very easily to a man in his circumstances, when the Senate had made its last decrees, conferring upon Caesar unlimited powers, the senators, consuls, and praetors, or the whole Senate, in festal attire, presented the decrees to him. And Caesar, at the moment, forgot to show his respect for the senators. He did not rise from his cella carulus, but received the decrees in an unceremonious manner. This want of politeness was never forgiven by the persons who had not scrupled to make him their master for it had been expected that he would at least behave politely and be grateful for such decrees. Caesar himself had no design in the act, which was merely the consequence of distraction or thoughtlessness, but it made the Senate his irreconcilable enemies. The affair with the tribunes, moreover, had made a deep impression upon the people. We must, however, remember that the people under such circumstances are most sensible to anything affecting their honor, as we have seen at the beginning of the French Revolution. In the year of Caesar's death, Brutus and Cassius were praetors. Both had been generals under Pompey. Brutus's mother, Servilia, was a half-sister of Cato, for after the death of her first husband, Cato's mother had married Servilius Capio. She was a remarkable woman, but very immoral and unworthy of her son. Not even the honor of her own daughter was sacred to her. The family of Brutus derived its origin from L. Unius Brutus, and from the time of its first appearance among the plebeians it had few men of importance to boast of. During the period subsequent to the passing of the Licinian laws, we meet with some uni in the fasti, but not one of them acquired any great reputation. The family had become reduced and almost contemptible. One, Mr. Brutus in particular, disgraced his family by syncophancy in the time of Sulla, and was afterward killed in Gaul by Pompey. Although no Roman family belonged to a more illustrious gens, yet Brutus was not by any means one of those men who are raised by fortunate circumstances. The education, however, which he received, had a great influence upon him. His uncle, Cato, whose daughter, Portia, he married, whether in Cato's lifetime or afterward is doubtful, had initiated him from his early youth in the Stoic philosophy, and had instilled into his mind a veneration for it, as though it had been a religion. Brutus had qualities which Cato did not possess. The latter had something of an aesthetic nature, and was, if I may say so, a scrupulously pious character. But Brutus had no such scrupulous timidity. His mind was more flexible and lovable. Cato spoke well, but could not be reckoned among the eloquent men of his time. Brutus's great talents had been developed with the utmost care, and if he had lived longer and in peace, he would have become a classical writer of the highest order. He had been known to Cicero from his early age, and Cicero felt a fatherly attachment to him. He saw in him a young man who he hoped would exert a beneficial influence upon the next generation. 
Caesar, too, had known and loved him from his childhood, but the stories which are related to account for this attachment must be rejected as foolish inventions of idle persons, for nothing is more natural than that Caesar should look with great fondness upon a young man of such extraordinary and amiable qualities. The absence of envy was one of the distinguishing features in the character of Caesar, as it was in that of Cicero. In the Battle of Pharsalus, Brutus served in the army of Pompey, and after the battle he wrote a letter to Caesar, who had inquired after him, and when Caesar heard of his safety he was delighted, and invited him to his camp. Caesar afterward gave him the administration of Cisalpine Gaul, where Brutus distinguished himself in a very extraordinary manner by his love of justice. Cassius was related to Brutus, and had likewise belonged to the Pompeian party. But he was very unlike Brutus. He was much older, and a distinguished military officer. After the death of Crassus, he had maintained himself as quaestor in Syria against the Parthians, and he enjoyed a very great reputation in the army. But he was, after all, no better than an ordinary officer of Caesar. After the Battle of Pharsalus, Caesar did not at first know whether Pompey was gone. Cassius was at the time stationed with some galleys in the Hellespont, notwithstanding which Caesar, with his usual boldness, took a boat to sail across that strait, and on meeting Cassius, called upon him to embrace his party. Cassius readily complied, and Caesar forgave him, as he forgave all his adversaries. Even Marcellus, who had mortally offended him, was pardoned at the request of Cicero. Caesar thus endeavored to efface all recollections of the civil war. Caesar had appointed both Brutus and Cassius praetors for that year. With the exception of the office of Praetor Urbanus, which was honorable and lucrative, the praetorship was a burdensome office and conferred little distinction, since the other praetors were only the presidents of the courts. Formerly they had been elected by lot, but the office was now altogether in the gifts of Caesar. Both Brutus and Cassius had wished for the praetor Urbana, and when Caesar gave that office to Brutus, Cassius was not only indignant at Caesar, but began quarreling with Brutus also. While Cassius was in this state of exasperation, a meeting of the Senate was announced for the 15th of March, on which day, as the report went, a proposal was to be made to offer Caesar the crown. This was a welcome opportunity for Cassius, who resolved to take vengeance, for he had, even before, entertained a personal hatred of Caesar, and was now disappointed at not having obtained the city praetorship. He first sounded Brutus, and, finding that he was safe, made direct overtures to him. During the night, someone wrote on the tribunal and the house of Brutus the words, Remember that thou art Brutus. Brutus became reconciled to Cassius, offered his assistance, and gained over several other persons to join the conspiracy. All party differences seemed to have vanished all at once. Two of the conspirators were old generals of Caesar, C. Trebonius and Decimus Brutus, both of whom had fought with him in Gaul and against Massilia, and had been raised to high honors by their chief. There were among the conspirators persons of all parties. Men who had fought against one another at Pharsalus now went hand in hand and entrusted their lives to one another. No proposals were made to Cicero, the reasons usually assigned for which are of the most calumniatory kind. It is generally said that the conspirators had no confidence in Cicero, an opinion which is perfectly contemptible. Cicero would not have betrayed them for any consideration, but what they feared were his objections. Brutus had as noble a soul as anyone, but he was passionate, 
Cicero, on the other hand, who was at an advanced age, had many sad experiences, and his feelings were so exceedingly delicate that he could not have consented to take away the life of him to whom he himself owed his own, who had always behaved most nobly toward him, and had intentionally drawn him before the world as his friend. Caesar's conduct toward those who had fought in the ranks of Pompey and afterward returned to him was extremely noble, and he regarded the reconciliation of those men as a personal favor conferred upon himself. All who knew Cicero must have been convinced that he would not have given his consent to the plan of the conspirators, and if they ever did give the matter a serious thought, they must have owned to themselves that every wise man would have dissuaded them from it for it was in fact the most complete absurdity to fancy that the Republic could be restored by Caesar's death. Goethe says somewhere that the murder of Caesar was the most senseless act that the Romans ever committed, and a truer word was never spoken. The result of it could not possibly be any other than that which did follow the deed. Caesar was cautioned by Hirtius and Panza, both wise men of noble character, especially the former, who saw that the Republic must become consolidated and not thrown into fresh convulsions. They advised Caesar to be careful and to take a bodyguard, but he replied that he would rather not live at all than be in constant fear of losing his life. Caesar once expressed to some of his friends his conviction that Brutus was capable of harboring a murderous design. But he added that as he, Caesar, could not live much longer, Brutus would wait and not be guilty of such a crime. Caesar's health was at the time weak, and the general opinion was that he intended to surrender his power to Brutus as the most worthy. While the conspirators were making their preparations, Portia, the wife of Brutus, inferred from the excitement and restlessness of her husband that some fearful secret was pressing on his mind. But, as he did not show her any confidence, she seriously wounded herself with a knife and was seized with a violent wound fever. No one knew the cause of her illness, and it was not till after many entreaties of her husband that, at length, she revealed it to him, saying that, as she had been able to conceal the cause of her illness, so she could also keep any secret that might be entrusted to her. Her entreaties induced Brutus to communicate to her the plan of the conspirators. Caesar was also cautioned by the Hara species, by a dream of his wife, and by his own forebodings, which we have no reason for doubting. But on the morning of the 15th of March, the day fixed upon for assassinating Caesar, Decimus Brutus treacherously enticed him to go with him to the Curia, as it was impossible to delay the deed any longer. The conspirators were at first seized with fear lest their plan should be betrayed. But on Caesar's entrance into the Senate house, C. Tilius, not Tullius, Kimber, made his way up to him and insulted him with his importunities and Casca gave the first stroke. Caesar fell covered with twenty-three wounds. He was either in his fifty-sixth year or had completed it. I am not quite certain on this point, though if we judge by the time of his first consulship, he must have been fifty-six years old. His birthday, which is not generally known, was the eleventh of Quintilis, which month was afterward called Julius and his death took place on the 15th of March, between 11 and 12 o'clock. End of section 32。section 33 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rositer Johnson, 1888-1945.
and John Rudd. Assassination of Caesar, B.C. 44, by Plutarch. At one time the Senate, having decreed Caesar some extravagant honors, the consuls and praetors, attended by the whole body of patricians, went to inform him of what they had done. When they came, he did not rise to receive them, but kept his seat, as if they had been persons in a private station, and his answer to their address was that there was more need to retrench his honors than to enlarge them. This haughtiness gave pain not only to the Senate, but the people, who thought the contempt of that body reflected dishonor upon the whole commonwealth, for all who could decently withdraw went off greatly dejected. Perceiving the false step he had taken, he retired immediately to his own house, and, laying his neck bare, told his friends he was ready for the first hand that would strike. He then bethought himself of alleging his distemper as an excuse, and asserted that those who are under its influence are apt to find their faculties fail them when they speak standing, a trembling and giddiness coming upon them which bereave them of their senses. This, however, was not really the case, for it is said he was desirous to rise to the Senate. But Cornelius Balbus, one of his friends, or rather flatterers, held him, and had servility enough to say, Will you not remember that you are Caesar, and suffer them to pay their court to you as their superior? These discontents were greatly increased by the indignity with which he treated the tribunes of the people. In the Lupercalia, which, according to most writers, is an ancient pastoral feast, and which answers in many respects to the Lycia among the Arcadians, young men of noble families, and indeed many of the magistrates, run about the streets naked, and by way of diversion strike all they meet with leathern thongs with their hair upon them. Numbers of women of the first quality put themselves in their way and present their hands for stripes, as scholars do to a master, being persuaded that the pregnant gain an easy delivery by it, and that the barren are unable to conceive. Caesar wore a triumphal robe that day, and seated himself in a golden chair upon the rostra to see the ceremony. Antony rang among the first, in compliance with the rules of the festival, for he was consul. When he came into the forum, and the crowd had made a way for him, he approached Caesar and offered him a diadem, wreathed with laurel. Upon this some plaudits were heard, but very feeble, because they proceeded only from persons placed there on purpose. Caesar refused it, and then the plaudits were loud and general. Antony presented it once more, and few applauded his officiousness. But when Caesar rejected it again, the applause again was general. Caesar, undeceived by his second trial, rose up and ordered the diadem to be consecrated in the capital. A few days after, his statues were seen adorned with royal diadems, and Flavius and Marullus, two of the tribunes, went and tore them off. They also found out the persons who first saluted Caesar King and committed them to prison. The people followed with cheerful acclamations and called them Brutuses, because Brutus was the man who expelled the kings and put the government in the hands of the Senate and people. Caesar, highly incensed at their behavior, disposed the tribunes, and by way of reprimand to them, as well as an insult to the people, called them several times Brutes and Cumsians. Upon this, many applied to Marcus Brutus, who, by the father's side, was supposed to be a descendant of that ancient Brutus, and whose mother was of the illustrious house of the Servili. He was also nephew and son-in-law to Cato, no man was more inclined than he to lift his hand against monarchy, 
but he was withheld by the honors and favors he had received from Caesar, who had not only given him his life after the defeat of Pompey at Pharsalia and pardoned many of his friends at his request, but continued to honor him with his confidence. That very year he had procured him the most honorable praetorship, and he had named him for the consulship four years after, in preference to Cassius, who was his competitor, on which occasion Caesar is reported to have said, Cassius assigns the strongest reasons, but I cannot refuse Brutus. Some impeached Brutus after the conspiracy was formed, but instead of listening to them, he laid his hands on his body and said, Brutus will wait for this skin, intimating that though the virtue of Brutus rendered him worthy of empire, he would not be guilty of any ingratitude or baseness to obtain it. Those, however, who were desirous of a change kept their eyes upon him only, or principally at least, and as they durst not speak out plain, they put billets night after night in the tribunal and seat which he used as praetor, mostly in these terms, Thou sleepest, Brutus, or Thou art not Brutus. Cassius, perceiving his friend's ambition, a little stimulated by these papers, began to ply him closer than before and spur him on to the great enterprise for he had a particular enmity against Caesar. Caesar, too, had some suspicion of him, and he even said one day to his friends, What think you of Cassius? I do not like his pale looks. Another time, when Antony and Dolabella were accused of some designs against his person and government, he said, I have no apprehensions from those fat and sleek men, I rather fear the pale and lean ones, meaning Cassius and Brutus. It seems from this instance that fate is not so secret as it is inevitable, for we are told there were strong signs and presages of the death of Caesar. As to the lights in the heavens, the strange noises heard in various quarters by night, and the appearance of solitary birds in the forum, Perhaps they deserve not our notice in so great an event as this. But some attention should be given to Strabo the philosopher. According to him, there were seen in the air men of fire encountering each other. Such a flame appeared to issue from the hand of a soldier's servant that all the spectators thought it must be burned. Yet, when it was over, he found no harm. And one of the victims, which Caesar offered, was found without a heart. The latter was certainly a most alarming prodigy, for, according to the rules of nature, no creature can exist without a heart. What is still more extraordinary, many report that a certain soothsayer forewarned him of a great danger which threatened him on the Ides of March, and that when the day was come, as he was going to the Senate House, he called to the soothsayer and said, laughing, The Ides of March are come, to which he answered softly, Yes, but they are not gone. The evening before, he supped with Marcus Lepidus, and signed, according to custom, a number of letters, as he sat at table. While he was so employed, there arose a question. What kind of death was best? And Caesar, answering before them all, cried out, A sudden one! The same night, as he was in bed with his wife, the doors and windows of the room flew open at once. Disturbed both with the noise and the light, he observed, by moonshine, Calpurnia in a deep sleep, uttering broken words and inarticulate groans. She dreamed that she was weeping over him, and she held him, murdered, in her arms. Others say she dreamed that the pinnacle was fallen, which, as Livy tells us, the Senate had ordered to be erected upon Caesar's house by way of ornament and distinction, and that it was the fall of it which she lamented and wept for. Be that as it may, the next morning she conjured Caesar not to go out that day if he could possibly avoid it, but to adjourn the Senate, 
and if he had no regard to her dreams, to have recourse to some other species of divination or to sacrifices for information as to his fate. This gave him some suspicion and alarm, for he had never known before, in Calpurnia, anything of the weakness or superstition of her sex, though she was now so much affected. He, therefore, offered a number of sacrifices, and as the diviners found no suspicious tokens in any of them, he sent Antony to dismiss the Senate. In the meantime, Decius Brutus, surnamed Albinus, came in. He was a person in whom Caesar placed such confidence that he had appointed him his second heir, yet he was engaged in the conspiracy with the other Brutus and Cassius. This man, fearing that if Caesar adjourned the Senate to another day the affair might be discovered, laughed at the diviners and told Caesar he would be highly to blame if by such a slight he gave the Senate an occasion of complaint against him. For they were met, he said, at his summons, and came prepared with one voice to honor him with the title of king in the provinces, and to grant that he should wear the diadem both by sea and land everywhere out of Italy. But if any one go and tell them now they have taken their places, they must go home again, and return when Calpurnia happens to have better dreams. What room will your enemies have to launch out against you? Or who will hear your friends when they attempt to show that this is not an open servitude on the one hand and tyranny on the other? If you are absolutely persuaded that this is an unlucky day, it is certainly better to go yourself and tell them you have strong reasons for putting off business till another time. So saying, he took Caesar by the hand and led him out. He was not gone far from the door when a slave, who belonged to some other person, attempted to get up to speak to him, but finding it impossible, by reason of the crowd that was about him, he made his way into the house, and putting himself into the hands of Calpurnia, desired her to keep him safe till Caesar's return, because he had matters of great importance to communicate. Artemidorus the Canidian, who, by teaching the Greek eloquence, became acquainted with some of Brutus's friends, and had got intelligence of most of the transactions, approached Caesar with a paper explaining what he had to discover. Observing that he gave the papers as fast as he received them to his officers, he got up as close as possible and said, Caesar, read this to yourself, and quickly, for it contains matters of great consequence and of the last concern to you. He took it, and attempted several times to read it, but was always prevented by one application or another. He therefore kept the paper, and that only, in his hand when he entered the house. Some say it was delivered to him by another man, Artemidorus being kept from approaching him all the way by the crowd. These things might indeed fall out by chance, but as in the place where the Senate was that day assembled, and which proved the scene of that tragedy, there was a statue of Pompey, and it was in edifice, which Pompey had consecrated for an ornament to his theatre, nothing can be clearer than that some deity conducted the whole business, and directed the execution of it to that very spot. Even Cassius himself, though inclined to the doctrines of Epicurus, turned his eye to the statue of Pompey, and secretly invoked his aid before the great attempt. The arduous occasion, it seems, overruled his former sentiments, and laid them open to all the influence of enthusiasm. Antony, who was a faithful friend to Caesar, and a man of great strength, was held in discourse without by Brutus Albinus, who had contrived a long story to detain him. When Caesar entered the house, the Senate rose to do him honor. Some of Brutus's accomplices came up behind his chair, and others before it, pretending to intercede, along with Natilius Kimber, for the recall of his brother from exile. They continued their instances till he came to his seat. When he was seated, he gave them a positive denial. 
and as they continued their importunities with an air of compulsion, he grew angry. Kimber, then, with both hands, pulled his gown off his neck, which was the signal for the attack. Casca gave him the first blow. It was a stroke upon the neck with his sword, but the wound was not dangerous, for in the beginning of so tremendous an enterprise he was probably in some disorder. Caesar, therefore, turned upon him and laid hold of his sword. At the same time they both cried out, the one in Latin, "'Villain, Casca, what dost thou mean?' and the other in Greek, to his brother. "'Brother, help!' After such a beginning, those who knew nothing of the conspiracy were seized with consternation and horror, insomuch that they durst neither fly nor assist, nor even utter a word. All the conspirators now drew their swords, and surrounded him in such a manner that, whatever way he turned, he saw nothing but steel gleaming in his face, and met nothing but wounds, like some savage beast attacked by the hunters. He found every hand lifted against him, for they all agreed to have a share in the sacrifice and a taste of his blood. Therefore Brutus himself gave him a stroke in the groin, some say he opposed the rest, and continued struggling and crying out till he perceived the sword of Brutus. Then he drew his robe over his face and yielded to his fate. Either by accident or pushed thither by the conspirators, he expired on the pedestal of Pompey's statue, and dyed it with his blood, so that Pompey seemed to preside over the work of vengeance to tread his enemy under his feet, and to enjoy his agonies. Those agonies were great, for he received no less than three and twenty wounds, and many of the conspirators wounded each other as they were aiming their blows at him. Caesar thus dispatched, Brutus advanced to speak to the Senate and to assign his reasons for what he had done, but they could not bear to hear him. They fled out of the house and filled the people with inexpressible horror and dismay. Some shut up their houses. Others left their shops and counters. All were in motion. One was running to see the spectacle, another running back. Antony and Lepidus, Caesar's principal friends, withdrew and hid themselves in other people's houses. Meantime, Brutus and his confederates, yet warm from the slaughter, marched in a body with their bloody swords in their hands from the Senate House to the Capitol, not like men that fled, but with an air of gaiety and confidence, calling the people to liberty, and stopping to talk with every man of consequence whom they met. There were some who even joined them and mingled with their train, desirous of appearing to have had a share in the action, and hoping for one in the glory. Of this number were Caius Octavius and Lentulus Spinther, who afterward paid dear for their vanity, being put to death by Antony and young Caesar, so that they gained not even the honor for which they lost their lives, for nobody believed that they had any part in the enterprise, and they were punished not for the deed, but for the will. Next day, Brutus and the rest of the conspirators came down from the capital and addressed the people, who attended to their discourse without expressing either dislike or approbation of what was done. But by their silence, it appeared that they pitied Caesar, at the same time that they revered Brutus. The Senate passed a general amnesty, and to reconcile all parties, they decreed Caesar divine honors and confirmed all the acts of his dictatorship, while on Brutus and his friends they bestowed governments, and such honors as were suitable, so that it was generally imagined the commonwealth was firmly established again, and all brought into the best order. But when, upon the opening of Caesar's will, it was found that he had left every Roman citizen a considerable legacy, and they beheld the body as it was carried through the forum, 
all mangled with wounds, the multitude could no longer be kept within bounds. They stopped the procession, and tearing up the benches, with the doors and tables, heaped them into a pile, and burned the corpse there. Then, snatching flaming brands from the pile, some ran to burn the houses of the assassins, while others ranged the city to find the conspirators themselves and tear them in pieces. But they had taken such care to secure themselves that they could not meet with one of them. One Kina, a friend of Caesar's, had a strange dream the preceding night. He dreamed, as they tell us, that Caesar invited him to supper, and upon his refusal to go, caught him by the hand and drew him in after him, in spite of all the resistance he could make. Hearing, however, that the body of Caesar was to be burned in the forum, he went to assist in doing him the last honors, though he had a fever upon him, the consequence of his uneasiness about his dream. On his coming up, one of the populace asked who that was and having learned his name told it to his next neighbor a report immediately spread through the whole company that it was one of caesar's murderers and indeed one of the conspirators was named kina the multitude taking this for the man fell upon him and tore him to pieces upon the spot brutus and cassius were so terrified at this range of the populace that a few days after they left the city an account of their subsequent actions, sufferings, and death may be found in the life of Brutus. Caesar died at the age of fifty-six, and did not survive Pompey above four years. His object was sovereign power and authority, which he pursued through innumerable dangers, and by prodigious efforts he gained it at last. But he reaped no other fruit from it than an empty and individuous title. It is true the divine power which conducted him through life attended him after his death as his avenger, pursued and hunted out the assassins over sea and land, and rested not till there was not a man left, either of those who dipped their heads in his blood or of those who gave their sanction to the deed. The most remarkable of natural events relative to this affair was that Cassius, after he had lost the battle of Philippi, killed himself with the same dagger which he had made use of against Caesar. And the most signal phenomenon in the heavens was that of a great comet, which shone very bright for seven nights after Caesar's death, and then disappeared. To which we may add the fading of the sun's luster, for his orb looked pale all that year, he rose not with a sparkling radiance, nor had the heat he afforded its usual strength. The air, of course, was dark and heavy, for want of that vigorous heat which clears and rarefies it. And the fruits were so crude and unconcocted that they pined away and decayed through the chillness of the atmosphere." we have a proof still more striking that the assassination of Caesar was displeasing to the gods in the phantom that appeared to Brutus. The story of it is this. Brutus was on the point of transporting his army from Abydos to the opposite continent, and the night before he lay in his tent awake, according to custom, and in deep thought about what might be the event of the war for it was natural for him to watch a great part of the night, and no general ever required so little sleep. With all his senses about him, he heard a noise at the door of his tent, and, looking toward the light, which was now burned very low, he saw a terrible appearance in the human form, but of prodigious stature and the most hideous aspect. At first he was struck with astonishment, but when he saw it neither did nor spoke anything to him, but stood in silence by his bed, he asked it who it was. The specter answered, I am thy evil genius, Brutus. Thou shalt see me at Philippi. Brutus answered boldly, I'll meet thee there. 
and the spectre immediately vanished. Some time after, he engaged Antony and Octavius Caesar at Philippi, and the first day was victorious, carrying all before him, where he fought in person, and even pillaging Caesar's camp. The night before he was to fight the second battle, the same spectre appeared to him again, but spoke not a word. Brutus, however, understood that his last hour was near, and courted danger with all the violence of despair. Yet he did not fall in the action. But seeing all was lost, he retired to the top of a rock, where he presented his naked sword to his breast. And a friend, as they tell us, assisting the thrust, he died upon the spot. End of section 33《Section 34 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 2. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson and John Root. Rome becomes a monarchy. Death of Antony and Cleopatra. B.C. 44 to 30. By Henry George Liddell. Part 1. After the death of Caesar, Rome was in confusion. Consternation seized the people, and the liberators failed to rally them to their own support. In possession of Caesar's treasure, Antony, the surviving consul, bided his time. His oration at Caesar's funeral stirred the populace against the liberators and made him for the moment master of Rome. But his self-seeking soon turned the people against him. The young Octavius, Caesar's heir, had become popular with the army. He returned to Rome and claimed his inheritance, demanded from Antony Caesar's monies, but in vain, and assumed the title of Caesar. The rivalry between the two leaders rapidly approached a crisis. The partisans of Antony and Octavius began to clash, and civil war followed. Defeated, Antony retreated across the Alps. Octavius was elected consul, and began negotiations with Antony and Lepidus, which resulted in the three new masters constituting themselves a triumvirate, the second triumvirate, to settle the affairs of the commonwealth. They divided the powers of government, and a partition of territory was made between them. Their next business was to put out of the way, by prescription, the enemies of this new order of things. Three hundred senators, including Cicero, were massacred, as well as two thousand knights. When the terrified Senate had legalized the self-assumed authority of the triumvirs, they turned their attention to Brutus and Cassius in the east, whither they had gone after the assassination of Caesar and established and maintained themselves in power. At the Battle of Philippi in Macedonia, B.C. 42, Antony and Octavius defeated Brutus and Cassius, both of whom died by their own hands. The Roman world was now in the hands of the triumvirs. Antony ruled in the east, Octavius in the west, and Lepidus in Africa, B.C. 42 to 36. In the latter year, Lepidus was deposed by Octavius after a short conflict, and only a year after Philippi, a war between Octavius and Antony was threatened because of a revolt in Italy raised by Antony's brother Lucius and Fulvia, wife of Antony. But it was prevented by a treaty of peace sealed by the marriage of Antony to Octavia, sister of Octavius.
This peace lasted for ten years, during which time there was constant friction between them. At Tarsus, in B.C. 41, Antony received a visit from Cleopatra, to whose charms he had yielded years before. This was the turning point in his career. He went with her to Alexandria. By his oppression of the people of the East, and his dalliance with Cleopatra, he made himself the object of hatred and contempt. His army met with a series of defeats. In the meantime, Octavius was constantly strengthening himself. The rivalry between them finally reached the point where both prepared for war. The great sea fight near Actium, September 2nd, B.C. 31, resulted in the destruction of Antony's fleet after he had followed Cleopatra in her flight. A year later occurred the death of both. This important battle established Octavius as the sole ruler of the Roman possessions, and historians regard it as marking the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire. While the conspirators were at their bloody work of slaying Caesar, the mass of the senators rushed in confused terror to the doors, and when Brutus turned to address his peers in defense of the deed, the hall was well-nigh empty. Cicero, who had been present, answered not, though he was called by name. Antony had hurried away to exchange his consular robes for the garb of a slave. Disappointed of obtaining the sanction of the Senate, the conspirators sallied out into the forum to win the ear of the people. But here, too, they were disappointed. Not knowing what massacre might be in store, every man had fled to his own house, and in vain the conspirators paraded the forum, holding up their blood-stained weapons and proclaiming themselves the liberators of Rome. Disappointment was not their only feeling. They were not without fear. They knew that Lepidus, being on the eve of departure for his province of Narbonnes Gaul, had a legion encamped on the island of the Tiber, and if he were to unite with Antony against them, Caesar would quickly be avenged. In all haste, therefore, they retired to the capital. Meanwhile, three of Caesar's slaves placed their master's body upon a stretcher and carried it to his house on the south side of the forum, with one arm dangling from the unsupported corner. In this condition, the widowed Calpurnia received the lifeless clay of him who had lately been sovereign of the world. Lepidus moved his troops to the campus Martius, but Antony had no thoughts of using force, for in that case probably Lepidus would have become master of Rome. During the night he took possession of the treasure which Caesar had collected to defray the expenses of his Parthian campaign, and persuaded Calpurnia to put into his hands all the dictator's papers. Possessed of these securities, he barricaded his house on the Carinae, and determined to watch the course of events. In the evening, Cicero, with other senators, visited the self-styled liberators in the capital. They had not communicated their plot to the orator, through fear, they said, of his irresolute counsels. But now that the deed was done, he extolled it as a godlike act. Next morning, Dolabella, Cicero's son-in-law, whom Caesar had promised should be his successor in the consulship, assumed the consular fasces and joined the liberators, while Cinna, son of the old Marian leader and therefore brother-in-law to Caesar, threw aside his praetorian robes, declaring he would no longer wear the tyrant's livery. Decimus Brutus, a good soldier, had taken a band of gladiators into pay to serve as a bodyguard of the liberators. Thus strengthened, they ventured again to descend into the forum, 
Brutus mounted the tribune and addressed the people in a dispassionate speech which produced little effect. But when Cinna assailed the memory of the dictator, the crowd broke out into menacing cries, and the liberators again retired to the capital. That same night they entered into negotiations with Antony, and the result appeared next morning the second after the murder. The Senate, summoned to meet, obeyed the call in large numbers. Antony and Dolabella attended in their consular robes, and Cinna resumed his praetorian garb. It was soon apparent that a reconciliation had been effected, for Antony moved that a general amnesty should be granted, and Cicero seconded the motion in an animated speech. It was carried, and Antony next moved that all the acts of the dictator should be recognized as law. He had his own purposes here, but the liberators also saw in the motion an advantage to themselves, for they were actually in possession of some of the chief magistracies, and had received appointments to some of the richest provinces of the empire. This proposal, therefore, was favorably received, but it was adjourned to the next day, together with the important question of Caesar's funeral. On the next day, Caesar's acts were formally confirmed, and among them his will was declared valid, though its provisions were yet unknown. After this it was difficult to reject the proposal that the dictator should have a public burial. Old senators remembered the riots that attended the funeral of Clodius and shook their heads. Cassius opposed it, but Brutus with imprudent magnanimity decided in favor of allowing it. To seal the reconciliation, Lepidus entertained Brutus at dinner, and Cassius was feasted by Mark Antony. The will was immediately made public. Cleopatra was still in Rome, and entertained hopes that the boy Caesarian would be declared the dictator's heir, for though he had been married thrice, there was no one of his lineage surviving. But Caesar was too much a Roman, and knew the Romans too well, to be guilty of this folly. Young Caesar Octavius, his sister's son, was declared his heir. Legacies were left to all his supposed friends, among whom were several of those who had assassinated him. His noble gardens beyond the Tiber were devised to the use of the public, and every Roman citizen was to receive a donation of three hundred sesterces, between ten and fifteen dollars. The effect of this recital was electric. Devotion to the memory of the dictator and hatred for his murderers at once filled every breast. Two or three days after this followed the funeral. The body was to be burned and the ashes deposited in the Campus Martius, near the tomb of his daughter, Julia. But it was first brought into the forum upon a bier inlaid with ivory and covered with rich tapestries, which was carried by men high in rank and office. There Antony as consul rose to pronounce the funeral oration. He ran through the chief acts of Caesar's life, recited his will, and then spoke of the death which had rewarded him. To make this more vividly present to the excitable Italians, he displayed a waxen image marked with the three-and-twenty wounds, and produced the very robe which he had worn, all rent and blood-stained. Soul-stirring dirges added to the solemn horror of the scene. But to us the memorable speech which Shakespeare puts into Antony's mouth will give the liveliest notion of the art used and the impression produced. That impression was instantaneous. The senator friends of the liberators who had attended the ceremony looked on in moody silence. Soon the menacing gestures of the crowd made them look to their safety.
They fled, and the multitude insisted on burning the body, as they had burned the body of Clodius, in the sacred precincts of the Forum. Some of the veterans who attended the funeral set fire to the bier. Benches and firewood heaped round it soon made a sufficient pile. From the blazing pyre the crowd rushed, eager for vengeance, to the houses of the conspirators. But all had fled betimes. One poor wretch fell a victim to the fury of the mob, Helvius Cinna, a poet who had devoted his art to the service of the dictator. He was mistaken for Lucius Cornelius Cinna, the praetor, and was torn to pieces before the mistake could be explained. Antony was now the real master of Rome. The treasure which he had seized gave him the means of purchasing goodwill and of securing the attachment of the veterans stationed in various parts of Italy. He did not, however, proceed in the course which, from the tone of his funeral harangue, might have been expected. He renewed friendly intercourse with Brutus and Cassius, who were encouraged to visit Rome once at least, if not oftener, after that day. And Decimus Brutus, with his gladiators, was suffered to remain in the city. Antony went still further. He gratified the Senate by passing a law to abolish the dictatorship forever. He then left Rome to win the favor of the Italian communities and try the temper of the veterans. Meanwhile, another actor appeared upon the scene. This was young Octavius. He had been but six months in the camp at Apollonia, but in that short time he had formed a close friendship with Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, a young man of his own age, who possessed great abilities for active life, but could not boast of any distinguished ancestry. As soon as the news of his uncle's assassination reached the camp, his friend Agrippa recommended him to appeal to the troops and march upon Rome. But the youth, with a wariness above his years, resisted these bold counsels. Landing near Brundusium almost alone, he there first heard that Caesar's will had been published and that he was declared Caesar's heir. He at once accepted the dangerous honor. As he traveled slowly toward the city, he stayed some days at Puteoli with his mother Atia, who was now married to Lucius Philippus. Both mother and stepfather attempted to dissuade him from the perilous business of claiming his inheritance. At the same place he had an interview with Cicero, who had quitted Rome in despair after the funeral, and left the orator under the impression that he might be one to what was deemed the patriotic party. He arrived at Rome about the beginning of May, and demanded from Antony, who had now returned from his Italian tour, an account of the monies of which the consul had taken possession, in order that he might discharge the obligations laid upon him by his uncle's will. But Antony had already spent great part of the money in bribing Dolabella and other influential persons nor was he willing to give up any portion of his spoil. Octavius therefore sold what remained of his uncle's property, raised money on his own credit, and paid all legacies with great exactness. This act earned him much popularity. Antony began to fear this boy of eighteen, whom he had hitherto despised, and the Senate learned to look on him as a person to be conciliated. Still, Antony remained in possession of all actual power. Cicero, not remarkable for political firmness, in this crisis displayed a vigor worthy of his earlier days. He had at one moment made up his mind to retire from public life and end his days at Athens in learned leisure. In the course of this summer he continued to employ himself on some of his most elaborate treatises. His work on the nature of the gods and on divination, his offices, his dialogue on old age, 
and several other essays belong to this period and mark the restless activity of his mind. But though he twice set sail from Italy, he was driven back to port at Velia, where he found Brutus and Cassius. Here he received letters from Augustus Hertius and other friends of Caesar, which gave him hopes that, in the name of Octavius, they might successfully oppose Antony and restore constitutional government. He determined to return, and announced his purpose to Brutus and Cassius, who commended him and took leave of him. They went their way to the east to raise armies against Antony. He repaired to Rome to fight the battles of his party in the Senate House. Meanwhile, Antony had been running riot. In possession of Caesar's papers with no one to check him, he produced ready warrant for every measure which he wished to carry, and pleaded the vote of the Senate, which confirmed all the acts of Caesar. When he could not produce a genuine paper, he interpolated or forged what was needful. On the day after Cicero's return, September 1st, there was a meeting of the Senate, but the orator did not attend, and Antony threatened to send men to drag him from his house. Next day Cicero was in his place, but now Antony was absent. The orator arose and addressed the Senate in what is called his first Philippic. This was a measured attack upon the government and policy of Antony, but personalities were carefully eschewed. The tone of the whole speech, indeed, is such as might be delivered by a leader of opposition in Parliament at the present day. But Antony, enraged at his boldness, summoned a meeting for the 19th of September, which Cicero did not think it prudent to attend. He then attacked the absent orator in the strongest language of personal abuse and menace, Cicero sat down and composed his famous second Philippic, which is written as if it were delivered on the same day in reply to Antony's invective. At present, however, he contented himself with sending a copy of it to Atticus, enjoining secrecy. Matters quickly drew to a head between Antony and Octavius. The latter had succeeded in securing a thousand men of his uncle's veterans who had settled in Campania, and by great exertions in the different towns of Italy had levied a considerable force. Meantime, four of the Epirote legions had just landed at Brundusium, and Antony hastened to attach them to his cause. But the largesse which he offered them was only a hundred denaries a man, and the soldiers laughed in his face. Antony, enraged at their conduct, seized the ringleaders and decimated them. But this severity only served to change their open insolence into sullen anger, and emissaries from Octavius were ready to draw them over to the side of their young master. They had so far obeyed Antony as to march northward to Ariminum, while he repaired to Rome. But as he entered the Senate house, he heard that two of the four legions had deserted to his rival, and in great alarm he hastened to the camp just in time to keep the remainder of the troops under his standard by distributing to every man five hundred denaries. The persons to hold the consulship for the next year had been designated by Caesar. They were both old officers of the Gallic army, Gaius Vibius Pansa Catronianus and Augustus Hertius, the reputed author of the eighth book of the history of the Gallic war. Cicero was ready to believe that they had become patriots, because, disgusted with the arrogance of Antony, they had declared for Octavius and the Senate. Antony began to fear that all parties might combine to crush him. He determined, therefore, no longer to remain inactive, 
and about the end of November, having now collected all his troops at Ariminum, he marched along the Emilian road to drive Decimus Brutus out of Cisalpine Gaul. Decimus was obliged to throw himself into Mutina, Modena, and Antony blockaded the place. As soon as his back was turned, Cicero published the famous Second Philippic, in which he lashed the consul with the most unsparing hand, going through the history of his past life, exaggerating the debaucheries which were common to Antony with great part of the Roman youth, and painting in the strongest colors the profligate use he had made of Caesar's papers. Its effect was great, and Cicero followed up the blow by the following twelve philippics, which were speeches delivered in the Senate House and Forum at intervals from December 44 to April in the next year. Cicero was anxious to break with Antony at once by declaring him a public enemy, but the latter was still regarded by many senators as the head of the Caesarian party, and it was resolved to treat with him. But the demands of Antony were so extravagant that negotiations were at once broken off, and nothing remained but to try the fortune of arms. The consuls proceeded to levy troops, but so exhausted was the treasury that now, for the first time since the triumph of Aemilius Paulus, it was found necessary to levy a property tax on the citizens of Rome. Octavius and the consuls assembled their forces at Alba. On the first day of the new year, 43, Hertius marched for Mutina with Octavius under his command. The other consul, Panza, remained at Rome to raise new levies, but by the end of March he also marched to form a junction with Hertius. Both parties pretended to be acting in Caesar's name. Antony left his brother Lucius in the trenches before Mutina and took the field against Hertius and Octavius. For three months the opponents lay watching each other, but when Antony learned that Panza was coming up, he made a rapid movement southward with two of his veteran legions and attacked him. A sharp conflict followed, in which Panza's troops were defeated, and the consul himself was carried, mortally wounded, off the field. But Hertius was on the alert and assaulted Antony's weary troops on their way back to their camp with some advantage. This was on the 15th of April, and on the 27th Hertius drew Antony from his entrenchments before Mutina. A fierce battle followed, which ended in the troops of Antony being driven back into their lines. Hertius followed close upon the flying enemy. The camp was carried by storm, and a complete victory would have been won had not Hertius himself fallen. Upon this disaster Octavius drew off the troops. The news of the first battle had been reported at Rome as a victory, and gave rise to extravagant rejoicings. The second battle was really a victory, but all rejoicing was damped by the news that one consul was dead and the other dying. No such fatal mischance had happened since the Second Punic War, when Marcellus and Crispinus fell in one day. End of section 34section 35 of the great events by famous historians volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros the great events by famous historians volume 2 edited by charles f horn Rossiter Johnson and John Root. Rome becomes a monarchy. Part two. After his defeat, Antony felt it impossible 
the siege of mutina with decimus brutus in the town behind him and the victorious legions of octavius before him his position was critical he therefore prepared to retreat and effected this purpose like a good soldier his destination was the province of narbonnes gaul where lepidus had assumed the government and had promised him support but the senate also had hopes in the same quarter lucius munatius plancus commanded in northern gaul and gaius asinius polio in southern spain sextai pompeius had made good his ground in the latter country and had almost expelled polio from Baetica. Plancus and Polio, both friends and favorites of Caesar, had as yet declared neither for Antony nor Octavius. If they would declare for the Senate, Lepidus, a feeble and fickle man, might desert Antony, or if Octavius would join with Decimus Brutus and pursue him, Antony might not be able to escape from Italy at all. But these political combinations failed. Plancus and Pollio stood aloof, waiting for the course of events. Decimus Brutus was not strong enough to pursue Antony by himself, and Octavius was unwilling, perhaps unable, to unite the veterans of Caesar with troops commanded by one of Caesar's murderers. And so it happened that Antony effected his retreat across the Alps, but not without extreme hardships, which he bore in common with the meanest soldier. It was at such times that his good qualities always showed themselves, and his gallant endurance of misery endeared him to every man under his command. On his arrival in Narbonnes Gaul, he met Lepidus at Forum Julii, Fregius, and here the two commanders agreed on a plan of operations. The conduct of Octavius gave rise to grave suspicions. It was even said that the consuls had been killed by his agents. Cicero, who had hitherto maintained his cause, was silent. He had delivered his fourteenth and last Philippic on the news of the first victory gained by Hertius but now he talked in private of removing the boy of whom he had hoped to make a tool. Octavius, however, had taken his part and was not to be removed. Secretly he entered into negotiations with Antony. After some vain efforts on the part of the Senate to thwart him, he appeared in the Campus Martius with his legions. Cicero and most of the senators disappeared, and the fickle populace greeted the young heir of Caesar with applause. Though he was not yet twenty, he demanded the consulship, having been previously relieved from the provisions of the Lex Annalis by a decree of the Senate, and he was elected to the first office in the state with his cousin Quintus Pedius. A curiate law passed, by which Octavius was adopted into the patrician gens of the Julii, and was put into legal possession of the name which he had already assumed, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. We shall henceforth call him Octavian. The change in his policy was soon indicated by a law in which he formally separated himself from the Senate. Pedius brought it forward, by its provisions, all Caesar's murderers were summoned to take their trial. Of course, none of them appeared, and they were condemned by default. By the end of September, Octavian was again in Cisalpine Gaul, and in close negotiation with Antony and Lepidus. The fruits of his conduct soon appeared. Plancus and Pollio declared against Caesar's murderers. Decimus Brutus, deserted by his soldiery, attempted to escape into Macedonia through Illyricum, but he was overtaken near Aquileia and slain by order of Antony. Italy and Gaul being now clear of the senatorial party, Lepidus as mediator arranged a meeting between Octavian and Antony, 
upon an island in a small river near Bononia, Bologna. Here the three potentates agreed that they should assume a joint and coordinate authority, under the name of Triumvirs for Settling the Affairs of the Commonwealth. Antony was to have the two Gauls, except the Narbonnes district, which, with Spain, was assigned to Lepidus. Octavian received Sicily, Sardinia, and Africa. Italy was for the present to be left to the consuls of the year, and for the ensuing year Lepidus, with Plancus, received promise of this high office. In return, Lepidus gave up his military force, while Octavian and Antony, each at the head of ten legions, prepared to conquer the eastern part of the empire, which could not yet be divided like the western provinces, because it was in possession of Brutus and Cassius. But before they began war, the triumvirs agreed to follow the example set by Scylla, to extirpate their opponents by a proscription, and to raise money by confiscation. They framed a list of all men's names whose death could be regarded as advantageous to any of the three, and on this list each in turn pricked a name. Antony had made many personal enemies by his proceedings at Rome, and was at no loss for victims. Octavian had few direct enemies, but the boy despot discerned with precocious sagacity those who were likely to impede his ambitious projects, and chose his victims with little hesitation. Lepidus would not be left behind in the bloody work. The author of the Philippics was one of Antony's first victims. Octavian gave him up, and took as an equivalent for his late friend the life of Lucius Caesar, uncle of Antony. Lepidus surrendered his brother Paulus for some similar favor. So the work went on. Not fewer than three hundred senators and two thousand knights were on the list. Quintus Pedius, an honest and upright man, died in his consulship, overcome by vexation and shame at being implicated in these transactions. As soon as their secret business was ended, the triumvirs determined to enter Rome publicly. Hitherto they had not published more than seventeen names of the proscribed. They made their entrance severally on three successive days, each attended by a legion. A law was immediately brought in to invest them formally with the supreme authority which they had assumed. This was followed by the promulgation of successive lists, each larger than its predecessor. Among the victims, far the most conspicuous was Cicero. With his brother Quintus, the old orator, had retired to his Tusculan villa after the Battle of Mutina, and now they endeavored to escape in the hope of joining Brutus in Macedonia for the orator's only son was serving as a tribune in the liberator's army. After many changes of domicile, they reached Astora, a little island near Antium, where they found themselves short of money, and Quintus ventured to Rome to procure the necessary supply. Here he was recognized and seized, together with his son, each desired to die first, and the mournful claim to precedence was settled by the soldiers killing both at the same moment. Meantime, Cicero had put to sea, but even in this extremity he could not make up his mind to leave Italy, and put to land at Circei. After further hesitation he again embarked, and again sought the Italian shore near Formiae. For the night he stayed at his villa near that place, and next morning would not move, exclaiming, Let me die in my own country, that country which I have so often saved. But his faithful slaves forced him into a litter, and carried him again toward the coast. 
Scarcely were they gone when a band of Antony's bloodhounds reached his villa, and were put upon the track of their victim by a young man who owed everything to the Ciceros. The old orator from his litter saw the pursuers coming up. His own followers were strong enough to have made resistance, but he desired them to set the litter down. Then, raising himself on his elbow, he calmly waited for the ruffians, and offered his neck to the sword. He was soon dispatched. The chief of the band, by Antony's express orders, hewed off the head and hands, and carried them to Rome. Fulvia, the widow of Claudius, and now the wife of Antony, drove her hairpin through the tongue which had denounced the iniquities of both her husbands. The head which had given birth to the second Philippic and the hands which had written it were nailed to the rostra, the home of their eloquence. The sight and the associations raised feelings of horror and pity in every heart. Cicero died in his sixty-fourth year. Brutus and Cassius left Italy in the autumn of B.C. 44 and repaired to the provinces which had been allotted to them, though by Antony's influence the Senate had transferred Macedonia from Brutus to his own brother Caius, and Syria from Cassius to Dolabella. Gaius Antonius was already in possession of parts of Macedonia, but Brutus succeeded in dislodging him. Meanwhile, Cassius, already well known in Syria for his successful conduct of the Parthian War, had established himself in that province before he heard of the approach of Dolabella. This worthless man left Italy about the same time as Brutus and Cassius, and at the head of several legions marched without opposition through Macedonia into Asia Minor. Here, Gaius Trebonius had already arrived, but he was unable to cope with Dolabella, and the latter surprised him and took him prisoner at Smyrna. He was put to death with unseemly contumely in Dolabella's presence. This was in February 43, and thus two of Caesar's murderers in less than a year's time felt the blow of retributive justice. When the news of this piece of butchery reached Rome, Cicero, believing that Octavian was a puppet in his hands, was ruling Rome by the eloquence of his Philippics. On his motion, Dolabella was declared a public enemy. Cassius lost no time in marching his legions into Asia to execute the behest of the Senate, though he had been dispossessed of his province by the Senate itself. Dolabella threw himself into Laodicea, where he sought a voluntary death. By the end of B.C. 43, therefore, the whole of the East was in the hands of Brutus and Cassius, but instead of making preparations for war with Antony, the two commanders spent the early part of the year 42 in plundering the miserable cities of Asia Minor. Brutus demanded men and money of the Lycians, and when they refused, he laid siege to Xanthus, their principal city. The Xanthians made the same brave resistance which they had offered five hundred years before to the Persian invaders. They burned their city and put themselves to death rather than submit. Brutus wept over their fate and abstained from further exactions but Cassius showed less moderation. From the Rhodians alone, though they were allies of Rome, he demanded all their precious metals. After this campaign of plunder, the two chiefs met at Sardis and renewed the altercations which Cicero had deplored in Italy. It is probable that war might have broken out between them had not the preparations of the triumvirs waked them from their dream of security. It was as he was passing over into Europe that Brutus, who continued his studious habits amid all disquietudes, and limited his time of sleep 
to a period too small for the requirements of health, was dispirited by the vision which Shakespeare, after Plutarch, has made famous. It was no doubt the result of a diseased frame, though it was universally held to be a divine visitation. As he sat in his tent in the dead of night, he thought a huge and shadowy form stood by him, and when he calmly asked, What and whence art thou? It answered, or seemed to answer, I am thine evil genius, Brutus. We shall meet again at Philippi. Meantime, Antony's lieutenants had crossed the Ionian Sea and penetrated without opposition into Thrace. The Republican leaders found them at Philippi. The army of Brutus and Cassius amounted to at least 80,000 infantry, supported by 20,000 horse, but they were ill supplied with experienced officers. For Marcus Valerius Messala, a young man of twenty-eight held the chief command after Brutus and Cassius, and Horace, who was but three and twenty, the son of a freedman, and a youth of feeble constitution, was appointed a legionary tribune. The forces opposed to them would have been at once overpowered had not Antony himself opportunely arrived with the second corps of the triumviral army. Octavian was detained by illness at Dyrrachium, but he ordered himself to be carried on a litter to join his legions. The army of the triumvirs was now superior to the enemy, but their cavalry, counting only 13,000, was considerably weaker than the force opposed to it. The Republicans were strongly posted upon two hills, with entrenchments between, the camp of Cassius upon the left next the sea, that of Brutus inland on the right. The triumviral army lay upon the open plain before them, in a position rendered unhealthy by marshes. Antony on the right was opposed to Cassius, Octavian on the left fronted Brutus. But they were ill-supplied with provisions and anxious for a decisive battle. The Republicans, however, kept to their entrenchments, and the other party began to suffer severely from famine. Determined to bring on an action, Antony began works for the purpose of cutting off Cassius from the sea. Cassius had always opposed a general action, but Brutus insisted on putting an end to the suspense, and his colleague yielded. The day of the attack was probably in October. Brutus attacked Octavian's army, while Cassius assaulted the working parties of Antony. Cassius's assault was beaten back with loss, but he succeeded in regaining his camp in safety. Meanwhile, Messala, who commanded the right wing of Brutus' army, had defeated the host of Octavian, who was still too ill to appear on the field, and the Republican soldiers penetrated into the triumvir's camp. Presently his litter was brought in, stained with blood, and the corpse of a young man found near it was supposed to be Octavian's. But Brutus, not receiving any tidings of the movements of Cassius, became so anxious for his fate that he sent off a party of horse to make inquiries, and neglected to support the successful assaults of Messala. Cassius, on his part, discouraged at his ill success, was unable to ascertain the progress of Brutus. When he saw the party of horse, he hastily concluded that they belonged to the enemy, and retired into his tent with his freedman Pindarus. What passed there we know not for certain. Cassius was found dead, with the head severed from the body. Pindarus was never seen again. It was generally believed that Pindarus slew his master in obedience to orders, but many thought that he had dealt a felon blow. The intelligence of Cassius' death was a heavy blow to Brutus. He forgot his own success and pronounced the elegy of Cassius in the well-known words, There lies the last of the Romans. The praise was ill-deserved. 
Except in his conduct of the war against the Parthians, Cassius had never played a worthy part. After the first battle of Philippi, it would have still been politic in Brutus to abstain from battle. The triumviral armies were in great distress, and every day increased their losses. Reinforcements coming to their aid by sea were intercepted, a proof of the neglect of the Republican leaders in not sooner bringing their fleet into action. Nor did Brutus ever hear of this success. He was ill-fitted for the life of the camp, and after the death of Cassius he only kept his men together by largesse and promises of plunder. Twenty days after the first battle, he led them out again. Both armies faced one another. There was little maneuvering. The second battle was decided by numbers and force, not by skill, and it was decided in favor of the triumphers. Brutus retired with four legions to a strong position in the rear, while the rest of his broken army sought refuge in the camp. Octavian remained to watch them, while Antony pursued the Republican chief. Next day, Brutus endeavored to rouse his men to another effort, but they sullenly refused to fight, and Brutus withdrew with a few friends into a neighboring wood. Here he took them aside one by one, and prayed each to do him the last service that a Roman could render to his friend. All refused with horror till at nightfall a trusty Greek freedman named Strato held the sword, and his master threw himself upon it. Most of his friends followed the sad example. The body of Brutus was sent by Antony to his mother. His wife Portia, the daughter of Cato, refused all comfort, and being too closely watched to be able to slay herself by ordinary means, she suffocated herself by thrusting burning charcoal into her mouth. Masala, with a number of other fugitives, sought safety in the island of Thasos, and soon after made submission to Antony. The name of Brutus has, by Plutarch's beautiful narrative, sublimed by Shakespeare, become a byword for self-devoted patriotism. This exalted opinion is now generally confessed to be unjust. Brutus was not a patriot, unless devotion to the party of the Senate be patriotism. Toward the provincials he was a true Roman, harsh and oppressive. He was free from the sensuality and profligacy of his age, but for public life he was unfit. His habits were those of a student. His application was great, his memory remarkable, but he possessed little power of turning his acquirements to account, and to the last he was rather a learned man than a man improved by learning. In comparison with Cassius he was humane and generous, but in all respects his character is contrasted for the worse with that of the great man from whom he accepted favors, and then became his murderer. The Battle of Philippi was in reality the closing scene of the Republican drama, but the rivalship of the triumvirs prolonged for several years the divided state of the Roman world, and it was not till after the crowning victory of Actium that the imperial government was established in its unity. We shall, therefore, here add a rapid narrative of the events which led to that consummation. The hopeless state of the Republican, or rather the Senatorial Party, was such that almost all hastened to make submission to the conquerors. Those whose sturdy spirits still disdained submission resorted to Sextae Pompeius in Sicily. Octavian, still suffering from ill health, was anxious to return to Italy, but before he parted from Antony, they agreed to a second distribution of the provinces of the empire. Antony was to have the eastern world, Octavian the western provinces. To Lepidus, who was not consulted in this second division, Africa alone was left. Sextae Pompeius remained in possession of Sicily.
Antony at once proceeded to make a tour through Western Asia in order to exact money from its unfortunate people. About midsummer, B.C. 41, he arrived at Tarsus, and here he received a visit which determined the future course of his life and influenced Roman history for the next ten years. Antony had visited Alexandria fourteen years before, and had been smitten by the charms of Cleopatra, then a girl of fifteen. She became Caesar's paramour, and from the time of the dictator's death Antony had never seen her. She now came to meet him in Cilicia. The galley which carried her up the Cydnus was of more than oriental gorgeousness, the sails of purple, oars of silver, moving to the sound of music, the raised poop burnished with gold. There she lay upon a splendid couch, shaded by a spangled canopy. Her attire was that of Venus. Around her flitted attendants, cupids, and graces. At the news of her approach to Tarsus, the triumvir found his tribunal deserted by the people. She invited him to her ship, and he complied. From that moment he was her slave. He accompanied her to Alexandria, exchanged the Roman garb for the Greco-Egyptian costume of the court, and lent his power to the queen to execute all her caprices. Meanwhile, Octavian was not without his difficulties. He was so ill at Brondusium that his death was reported at Rome. The veterans, eager for their promised rewards, were on the eve of mutiny. In a short time Octavian was sufficiently recovered to show himself, but he could find no other means of satisfying the greedy soldiery than by a confiscation of lands more sweeping than that which followed the proscription of Scylla. The towns of Cisalpine Gaul were accused of favoring Decimus Brutus and saw nearly all their lands handed over to the new possessors. The young poet Virgil lost his little patrimony, but was reinstated at the instance of Pollio and Mecenas, and showed his gratitude in his first eclogue. Other parts of Italy also suffered. Apulia, for example, as we learn from Horace's friend Ophelus, who became the tenant of the estate which had formerly been his own. But these violent measures deferred rather than obviated the difficulty. The expulsion of so many persons threw thousands loose upon society, ripe for any crime. Many of the veterans were ready to join any new leader who promised them booty. Such a leader was at hand. Fulvia, wife of Antony, was a woman of fierce passions and ambitious spirit. She had not been invited to follow her husband to the east. She saw that in his absence imperial power would fall into the hands of Octavian. Lucius, brother of Mark Antony, was consul for the year, and at her instigation he raised his standard at Praeneste, but Lucius Antonius knew not how to use his strength, and young Agrippa, to whom Octavian entrusted the command, obliged Antonius and Fulvia to retire northward and shut themselves up in Perusia. Their store of provisions was so small that it sufficed only for the soldiery. Early in the next year, Perusia surrendered on condition that the lives of the leaders should be spared. The town was sacked. The conduct of Lucius Antonius alienated all Italy from his brother. While his wife, his brother, and his friends were quitting Italy in confusion, the arms of Antony suffered a still heavier blow in the eastern provinces, which were under his special government. After the battle of Philippi, Quintus Labenus, son of Caesar's old lieutenant Titus, sought refuge at the court of Orodes, king of Parthia. Encouraged by the proffered aid of a Roman officer, Pacorus, the king's son, led a formidable army into Syria.
Antony's lieutenant was entirely routed, and while Pecorus, with one army, poured into Palestine and Phoenicia, Quintus Labinus, with another, broke into Cilicia. Here he found no opposition, and, overrunning all Asia Minor, even to the Ionian Sea, he assumed the name of Parthicus, as if he had been a Roman conqueror of the people whom he served. End of section 35section thirty six the great events by famous historians volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the great events by famous historians volume two edited by charles f horn Rossiter Johnson, and John Root. Rome Becomes a Monarchy, Part Three. These complicated disasters roused Antony from his lethargy. He sailed to Tyre, intending to take the field against the Parthians, but the season was too far advanced, and he therefore crossed the Aegean to Athens, where he found Fulvia and his brother, accompanied by Pollio, Plancus, and others, all discontented with Octavian's government. Octavian was absent in Gaul, and their representation of the state of Italy encouraged him to make another attempt. Late in the year 41, Antony formed a league with Sextus Pompeius, and while that chief blockaded Thurii, and Consentia, Antony assailed Brandusium. Agrippa was preparing to meet this new combination, and a fresh civil war was imminent. But the soldiery was weary of war. Both armies compelled their leaders to make pacific overtures, and the new year was ushered in by a general peace, which was rendered easier by the death of Fulvia. Antony and Octavian renewed their professions of amity and entered Rome together in joint ovation to celebrate the restoration of peace. They now made a third division of the provinces by which Scodra Scutari in Illyricum was fixed as the boundary of the west and east. Lepidus was still left in possession of Africa. It was further agreed that Octavian was to drive Sextus Pompeius, lately the ally of Antony, out of Sicily, while Antony renewed his pledges to recover the standards of Crassus from the Parthians. The new compact was sealed by the marriage of Antony with Octavia, his colleague's sister, a virtuous and beautiful lady, worthy of a better consort. These auspicious events were celebrated by the lofty verse of Virgil's fourth eclogue. Sextus Pompeius had reason to complain. By the peace of Brandusium he was abandoned by his late friend to Octavian. He was not a man to brook ungenerous treatment. Of late years his possession of Sicily had given him command of the Roman corn market. During the winter which followed the peace of Brandusium, B.C. 40 to 39, Sextus blockaded Italy so closely that Rome was threatened with a positive dearth. Riots arose, the triumvirs were pelted with stones in the forum, and they deemed it prudent to temporize by inviting Pompey to enter their league. He met them at Misenum, and the two chiefs went on board his ship to settle the terms of alliance. It is said that one of his chief officers, a Greek named Menas, or Menodorus, suggested to him the expediency of putting to sea with the great prize, and then making his own terms. Sextus rejected the advice with the characteristic words, you should have done it without asking me. 
it was agreed that Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica should be given up to his absolute rule, and that Achaia should be added to his portion, so that the Roman world was now partitioned among four, Octavian, Antony, Lepidus, and Sextus Pompeius. On their return, the triumvirs were received with vociferous applause. Before winter, Antony sailed for Athens in company with Octavia, who for the time seems to have banished Cleopatra from his thoughts. But he disgusted all true Romans by assuming the attributes of Grecian gods and indulging in Grecian orgies. He found the state of things in the East greatly changed since his departure. He had commissioned Publius Ventidius Bassus, an officer who had followed Fulvia from Italy, to hold the Parthians in check till his return. Ventidius was son of a Picenian nobleman of Asculum, who had been brought to Rome as a captive in the social war. In his youth he had been a contractor to supply mules for the use of the Roman commissariat. But in the civil wars which followed, men of military talent easily rose to command, and such was the lot of Ventidius. While Antony was absent in Italy, he drove Quintus Labenus into the defiles of Taurus, and here that adventurer was defeated and slain. The conqueror then marched rapidly into Syria, and forced Pacorus also to withdraw to the eastern bank of the Euphrates. In the following year, 38, he repelled a fresh invasion of the Parthians, and defeated them in three battles. In the last of these engagements, Pacorus himself was slain on the fifteenth anniversary of the death of Crassus. Antony found Ventidius laying siege to Samosata, and displaced him, only to abandon the siege and return to Athens. Ventidius repaired to Rome, where he was honored with a well-deserved triumph. He had left it as a mule-jobber. He returned with the laurel round his brows. He was the first and almost the last Roman general who could claim such a distinction for victory over the Parthians. The alliance with Sextus Pompeius was not intended to last, and it did not last. Antony refused to put him in possession of Achaia, and to avenge himself for this breach of faith, Pompeius again began to intercept the Italian corn fleets. Fresh discontent appeared at Rome, and Octavian equipped a second fleet to sail against the naval chief. But after two battles of doubtful result, the fleet was destroyed by a storm, and Sextus was again left in undisputed mastery of the sea. Octavian, however, was never daunted by reverses, and he gave his favorite Agrippa full powers to conduct the war against Pompeius. This able commander set about his work with that resolution that marked a man determined not to fail. As a harbor for his fleet, he executed a plan of the great Caesar, namely to make a good and secure harbor on the coast of Latium, which then as now offered no shelter to ships. For this purpose he cut a passage through the narrow necks of land which separated Lake Lucrinus from the sea, and Lake Avernus from Lake Lucrinus, and faced the outer barrier with stone. This was the famous Julian port. In the whole of the two years B.C. 38 and 37, Agrippa was occupied in this work, and in preparing a sufficient force of ships, every dockyard in Italy was called into requisition. A large body of slaves was set free that they might be trained to serve as rowers. On the 1st of July, B.C. 36, the fleet put to sea. Octavian himself 
with one division, purposed to attack the northern coast of Sicily, while a second squadron was assembled at Tarentum for the purpose of assailing the eastern side. Lepidus, with a third fleet from Africa, was to assault Lilibaeum. But the winds were again adverse, and though Lepidus effected a landing on the southern coast, Octavian's two fleets were driven back to Italy with great damage. But the injured ships were refitted, and Agrippa was sent westward toward Panormus, while Octavian himself kept guard near Messana. Off Milet, a place famous for having witnessed the first naval victory of the Romans, Agrippa encountered the fleet of Sextus Pompeius, but Sextus, with the larger portion of his ships, gave Agrippa the slip, and sailing eastward fell suddenly upon Octavian's squadron off Toromenium. A desperate conflict followed, which ended in the complete triumph of Sextus, and Octavian escaped to Italy with a few ships only. But Agrippa was soon upon the traces of the enemy. On the 3rd of September, Sextus was obliged once more to accept battle near the Straits of Messana, and suffered an irretrievable defeat. His troops on land were attacked and dispersed by an army which had been landed on the eastern coast by the indefatigable Octavian, and Sextus sailed off to Lesbos, where he had found a refuge as a boy, during the campaign of Pharsalia, to seek protection from the jealousy of Antony. Lepidus had assisted in the campaign, but after the departure of Sextus, he openly declared himself independent of his brother Triumvirs. Octavian, with prompt and prudent boldness, entered the camp of Lepidus in person with a few attendants. The soldiers deserted in crowds, and in a few hours Lepidus was fain to sue for pardon, where he had hoped to rule. He was treated with contemptuous indifference. Africa was taken from him, but he was allowed to live and die at Rome in quiet enjoyment of the chief pontificate. It was fortunate for Octavian that during this campaign Antony was on friendly terms with him. In B.C. 37, the ruler of the East again visited Italy, and a meeting between the two chiefs was arranged at Tarentum. The five years for which the triumphers were originally appointed were now fast expiring, and it was settled that their authority should be renewed by the subservient Senate and people for a second period of the same duration. They parted good friends, and Octavian undertook his campaign against Sextus Pompeius without fear from Antony. This was proved by the fate of the fugitive. From Lesbos, Sextus passed over to Asia, where he was taken prisoner by Antony's lieutenants and put to death. Hitherto, Octavia had retained her influence over Antony. But presently, after his last interview with her brother, the fickle triumvir abruptly quitted a wife who was too good for him, and returned to the fascinating presence of the Egyptian queen, whom he had not seen for three years. From this time forth he made no attempt to break the silken chain of her enchantments. During the next summer, indeed, he attempted a new Parthian campaign but his advance was made with reckless indifference to the safety of his troops. Provisions failed, disease broke out, and after great suffering he was forced to seek safety by a precipitate retreat into the Armenian mountains. In the next year he contented himself with a campaign in Armenia to punish the king of that country for alleged treachery in the last campaign. The king fell into his hands, and with this trophy Antony returned to Alexandria, where the Romans were disgusted to see the streets of a Greco-Egyptian town honored by a mimicry of a Roman triumph.
For the next three years he surrendered himself absolutely to the will of the enchantress. To this period belong those tales of luxurious indulgence which are known to every reader. The brave soldier, who, in the perils of war, could shake off all luxurious habits and could rival the commonest man in the cheerfulness with which he underwent every hardship, was seen no more. He sunk into an indolent voluptuary, pleased by childish amusements. At one time he would lounge in a boat at a fishing party, and laugh when he drew up pieces of salt fish, which, by the queen's order, had been attached to his hook by divers. At another time she wagered that she would consume ten million sesterces at one meal, and won her wager by dissolving in vinegar a pearl of unknown value. While Cleopatra bore the character of the goddess Isis, her lover appeared as Osiris. Her head was placed conjointly with his own on the coins which he issued as a Roman magistrate. He disposed of the kingdoms and principalities of the East by his sole word. By his influence, Herod, son of Antipater, the Idumean minister of Hyrcanus, the late sovereign of Judea, was made king to the exclusion of the rightful heir. Polemo, his own son by Cleopatra, was invested with the scepter of Armenia. Encouraged by the absolute submission of her lover, Cleopatra fixed her eye upon the capital, and dreamed of winning by means of Antony that imperial crown which she had vainly sought from Caesar. While Antony was engaged in voluptuous dalliance, Octavian was resolutely pursuing the work of consolidating his power in the West. His patience, his industry, his attention to business, his affability, were winning golden opinions and rapidly obliterating all memory of the bloody work by which he had risen to power. He had won little glory in war, but so long as the corn fleets arrived daily from Sicily and Africa, the populace cared little whether the victory had been won by Octavian or by his generals. In Agrippa he possessed a consummate captain, in Mecenas a wise and temperate minister. It is much to his credit that he never showed any jealousy of the men to whom he owed so much. He flattered the people with the hope that he would, when Antony had fulfilled his mission of recovering the standards of Crassus, engage him to join in putting an end to their sovereign power and restoring constitutional liberty. In point of fidelity to his marriage vows, Octavian was little better than Antony. He renounced his marriage with Claudia, the daughter of Fulvia, when her mother attempted to raise Italy against him. He divorced Scribonia when it no longer suited him to court the favor of her kinsmen. To replace this second wife, he forcibly took away Livia from her husband, Tiberius Claudius Nero, though she was at that time pregnant of her second son. But in this and other less pardonable immoralities, there was nothing to shock the feelings of Romans. But Octavian never suffered pleasure to divert him from business. If he could not be a successful general, he resolved at least to show that he could be a hardy soldier. While Antony in his Egyptian palace was neglecting the Parthian war, his rival led his legions in more than one dangerous campaign against the barbarous Dalmatians and Pannonians, who had been for some time infesting the province of Illyricum. In the year B.C. 33, he announced that the limits of the empire had been extended northward to the banks of the Save. Octavian now began to feel that any appearance of friendship with Antony was a source of weakness rather than of strength at Rome. Misunderstandings had already broken out. 
Antony complained that Octavian had given him no share in the provinces wrested from Sextus Pompeius and Lepidus. Octavian retorted by accusing his colleague of appropriating Egypt and Armenia, and of increasing Cleopatra's power at the expense of the Roman Empire. Popular indignation rose to its height when Plancus and Titius, who had been admitted to Antony's confidence, passed over to Octavian and disclosed the contents of their master's will. In that document, Antony ordered that his body should be buried at Alexandria, in the mausoleum of Cleopatra. Men began to fancy that Cleopatra had already planted her throne upon the capital. These suspicions were sedulously encouraged by Octavian. Before the close of B.C. 32, Octavian, by the authority of the Senate, declared war nominally against Cleopatra. Antony, roused from his sleep by reports from Rome, passed over to Athens, issuing orders everywhere to levy men and collect ships for the impending struggle. At Athens he received news of the declaration of war and replied by divorcing Octavia. His fleet was ordered to assemble at Corsira, and his legions in the early spring prepared to pour into Epirus. He established his headquarters at Patrae on the Corinthian Gulf. But Antony, though his fleet was superior to that of Octavian, allowed Agrippa to sweep the Ionian Sea and to take possession of Methone in Messenia as a station for a flying squadron to intercept Antony's communications with the east, nay, even to occupy Corsira, which had been destined for his own place of rendezvous. Antony's fleet now anchored in the waters of the Ambracian Gulf, while his legions encamped on a spot of land which forms the northern horn of that spacious inlet. But the place chosen for the camp was unhealthy, and in the heats of early summer his army suffered greatly from disease. Agrippa lay close at hand, watching his opportunity. In the course of the spring Octavian joined him in person. Early in the season, Antony had repaired from Petre to his army, so as to be ready either to cross over into Italy, or to meet the enemy if they attempted to land in Epirus. At first he showed something of his old military spirit, and the soldiers, who always loved his military frankness, warmed into enthusiasm. But his chief officers, won by Octavian, or, disgusted by the influence of Cleopatra, deserted him in such numbers that he knew not whom to trust, and gave up all thoughts of maintaining the contest with energy. Urged by Cleopatra, he resolved to carry off his fleet and abandon the army. All preparations were made in secret, and the great fleet put to sea on the 28th of August. For the four following days there was a strong gale from the south. Neither could Antony escape, nor could Octavian put to sea against him from Corsira. On the 2nd of September, however, the wind fell, and Octavian's light vessels, by using their oars, easily came up with the unwieldy galleys of the eastern fleet. A battle was now inevitable. Antony's ships were like impregnable fortresses to the assault of the slight vessels of Octavian, and though they lay nearly motionless in the calm sea, little impression was made upon them. But about noon a breeze sprung up from the west, and Cleopatra, followed by sixty Egyptian ships, made sail in a southerly direction. Antony immediately sprang from his ship of war into a light galley and followed. Deserted by their commander, the captains of Antony's ships continued to resist desperately, nor was it till the greater part of them were set on fire that the contest was decided. Before evening closed, 
the whole fleet was destroyed. Most of the men and all the treasure on board perished. A few days after, when the shameful flight of Antony was made known to his army, all his legions went over to the conqueror. It was not for eleven months after the Battle of Actium that Octavian entered the open gates of Alexandria. He had been employed in the interval in founding the city of Nicopolis to celebrate his victory on the northern horn of the Ambracian Gulf, in rewarding his soldiers and settling the affairs of the provinces of the east. In the winter he returned to Italy, and it was midsummer, B.C. 30, before he arrived in Egypt. When Antony and Cleopatra arrived off Alexandria, they put a bold face upon the matter. Some time passed before the real state of the case was known, but it soon became plain that Egypt was at the mercy of the conqueror. The queen formed all kinds of wild designs. One was to transport the ships that she had saved across the Isthmus of Suez and seek refuge in some distant land where the name of Rome was yet unknown. Some ships were actually drawn across, but they were destroyed by the Arabs and the plan was abandoned. She now flattered herself that her powers of fascination proved so potent over Caesar and Antony might subdue Octavian. Secret messages passed between the conqueror and the queen. Nor were Octavian's answers such as to banish hope. Antony, full of repentance and despair, shut himself up in Pharos, and there remained in gloomy isolation. In July, B.C. 30, Octavian appeared before Pelusium. The place was surrendered without a blow. Yet, at the approach of the conqueror, Antony put himself at the head of a division of cavalry and gained some advantage. But on his return to Alexandria, he found that Cleopatra had given up all her ships, and no more opposition was offered. On the 1st of August, Sextilis, as it was then called, Octavian entered the open gates of Alexandria. Both Antony and Cleopatra sought to win him. Antony's messengers the conqueror refused to see, but he still used fair words to Cleopatra. The queen had shut herself up in a sort of mausoleum built to receive her body after death, which was not approachable by any door, and it was given out that she was really dead. All the tenderness of old times revived in Antony's heart. He stabbed himself, and in a dying state, ordered himself to be laid by the side of Cleopatra. The queen, touched by pity, ordered her expiring lover to be drawn up by cords into her retreat and bathed his temple with her tears. After he had breathed his last, she consented to see Octavian. Her penetration soon told her that she had nothing to hope from him. She saw that his fair words were only intended to prevent her from desperate acts and reserve her for the degradation of his triumph. This impression was confirmed when all instruments by which death could be inflicted were found to have been removed from her apartments. But she was not to be so baffled. She pretended all submission but when the ministers of Octavian came to carry her away, they found her lying dead upon her couch, attended by her faithful waiting women, Eras and Charmian. The manner of her death was never ascertained. Popular belief ascribed it to the bite of an asp which had been conveyed to her in a basket of fruit. Thus died Antony and Cleopatra. Antony was by nature a genial, open-hearted Roman, a good soldier, quick, resolute, and vigorous, but reckless and self-indulgent, devoid alike of prudence and of principle. The corruptions of the age, the seductions of power, and the evil influence of Cleopatra paralyzed a nature capable of better things.' 
We know him chiefly through the exaggerated assaults of Cicero in his Philippic, and the narratives of writers devoted to Octavian. But after all deductions for partial representation, enough remains to show that Antony had all the faults of Caesar, with little of his redeeming greatness. Cleopatra was an extraordinary person. At her death she was but thirty-eight years of age. Her power rested not so much on actual beauty as on her fascinating manners and her extreme readiness of wit. In her follies there was a certain magnificence which excites even a dull imagination. We may estimate the real power of her mental qualities by observing the impression her character made upon the Roman poets of the time. No meditated praises could have borne such testimony to her greatness as the lofty strain in which Horace celebrates her fall and congratulates the Roman world on its escape from the ruin which she was threatening to the capital. Octavian dated the years of his imperial monarchy from the day of the battle of Actium, but it was not till two years after, the summer of B.C. 29, that he established himself in Rome as ruler of the Roman world. Then he celebrated three magnificent triumphs, after the example of his uncle, the great dictator, for his victories in Dalmatia, at Actium, and in Egypt. At the same time, the temple of Janus was closed, notwithstanding that border wars still continued in Gaul and Spain, for the first time since the year B.C. 235. All men drew breath more freely, and all except the soldiery looked forward to a time of tranquillity. Liberty and independence were forgotten words. After the terrible disorders of the last century, the general cry was for quiet at any price. Octavian was a person admirably fitted to fulfill these aspirations. His uncle Julius was too fond of active exertion to play such a part well. Octavian never shone in war, while his vigilant and patient mind was well fitted for the discharge of business. He avoided shocking popular feeling by assuming any title savoring of royalty, but he enjoyed by universal consent an authority more than regal. End of section 36